bluebirds all day long. Never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw day going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by. When you're in love, my, how they fly. Blue days, all of them gone. Nothing but blue. Sky smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. Blue birds singing a song, nothing but blue birds all day long. Never saw the sun shining so bright, never saw day going so right. Noticing the days hurrying by when you're in love, my, how they fly. Blue days, all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from now on. Thank you. I hope you can hear. We're staying kind of unplugged and acoustic while everybody gets settled. I um, mean, this is the mic for everybody, but I'll get a little closer. That's from the 1920s, and this is one of our own songs. It's what we're trying to capture everyone. Can you hear the band okay? Yeah? Yeah, okay, good. Then I'm the main thing that you can't hear. Huh? Okay. All right. This song is called Birds of a Feather, and it's about star-crossed lovers, and we think it sounds a little vintage. It goes something like this.
Island. We're in a band in San Francisco will come wearing 20s garb, playing 20s music. They'll be playing again later during the reception. Thank you, Brother Spellbinders. Well, welcome. Welcome to the grand reopening of the public domain. Right here, coming to you live from the great room of the Internet Archive in San Francisco, a room built in 1923. How's that for you? Good planning there, Brewster. And I want to welcome our live stream audience, too, watching from all over the world. If you want to send us a message, live stream audience, please go ahead and use the hashtag Public Domain Day. My name is Wendy Hanamura, and I am the Director of Partnerships here at the Internet Archive, and I am so honored and pleased to welcome you here to our hall. It is a great day of celebration. Why are we all wearing our grandparents' clothes? Why? Because on January 1st of this year, for the first time in two decades, materials from 1923, films, images, books, came in to the public domain. Now, why is that important? Well, we have many creators in this room, and I think you all know that creation always builds on the past. So these materials, they are the DNA, the building blocks of creativity to come. That's why we're celebrating today. We're celebrating this treasure trove of materials. We are also here to educate you about the incredible laws and regulations that we need in order to make this happen. And finally, we're here to motivate you to take this momentum of this day, this year, and build with it, build community, build communities of collaboration. So. Let's celebrate, let's educate, let's motivate, and let's enjoy this very, very momentous day. The other thing that makes this day so great is it's the coming together of two amazing organizations. No organization has done more to make sure that we can all share our intellectual property, all share the materials that we've created than the Creative Commons. And today, Creative Commons joins hands with the Internet Archive, this amazing digital library of everything dedicated to one purpose, to make sure that there is universal access to the great treasures of humankind. So without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you the founder, the digital librarian of the Internet Archive, Brewster Kale, and the CEO of Creative Commons, Ryan Merkley. Welcome to the open world. This is completely a fun and happening day. Um, I, I, I feel a little uh, awestruck in terms of being around. I think of the creators and the protectors of the open world. Hmm. That the internet came about in a time when we kind of thought it was all going to be open and shared, and it was for a while. Uh, and then there were other forces at, uh, afoot, and there are many of us that stayed and protected and came into the area of creating and protecting the open world. Creating and protecting the world that allows people to learn from the past and grow from it. To create and protect a world that allows people to build on the past and make new and different things. But I think actually the coolest thing is the open world is where we can play in new and different ways without always having to consult a lawyer. <laughs> that we can go and do this. And this is just a, 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 a grand day. And I'm really happy that uh, uh, Creative Commons and the Internet Archive uh, could come together uh, to, to put on this event. And you all came. So Ryan Merkley. Thank you, Brewster. You know, Brewster and I were saying after all this time, this is actually the first time that Creative Commons and the Internet Archive have ever officially run an event or done something together. Um, and I think we've done a great start, and this will be the first of many collaborations. So thank you so much for having us. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, this is fun for us. This is great. We're going to do more of this. Um, there are a lot of people to thank, and I won't thank them all right now, but there are two people I want to single out, Leela Bailey and Tim Vollmer. Please applaud for these two amazing individuals. 
tireless is not uh, the right word. Unrelenting and unstoppable might be better. Uh, for the amount of work that they have done, thank you so much, um, and many, many others, both at the IA and at CC and uh, around our community who have helped make this happen. This is a party. We're celebrating. Uh, and it actually feels a little bit like a family reunion this morning, talking to all of these folks. Um, sometimes people I've only known from the internet, and I always meet people on the internet and think, oh, I, I thought you were taller, because uh, everyone's sort of the same size on the internet. Um, and this has been really fun for me to meet them, and I was joking yesterday that like, if there was a fire, um, this would be the end of the internet brain trust, because everyone is here right now, and it's only going to get better as the day goes on. But during this, I really want you to ex you know, enjoy this celebration. This is a celebration of the unlocking of content that frankly should have been unlocked 20 years ago, but we're gonna take this as a joyous moment of a moment of innovation and creativity, of unleashing of new opportunities, uh, but also to celebrate all the work that all of you have done over all of these years uh, to build this strong community that powers so much of the internet that people care deeply about. Uh, so let's make this a moment of celebration, an acknowledgement of new things coming forward, and also an opportunity. Look, look next to your neighbor, meet someone new. There are incredible people in this room, and you should know them. They are delightful humans, and they've made the internet that you love possible. So let's have a great day. Let's celebrate the public domain and the commons, uh, and I'm really looking forward to our talks today. Take care. <laughs> this way, right? Okay, we have an incredible program for you in the next few hours. And um, we're going to start with a little bit of history, somebody who made history. You know, back in 1998, when Congress extended the copyright term, I think year after year at New Year's, it would roll around and, you know, New Year's would come and we would sigh wistfully at what might have been. But there was a team, a team at Duke University Law School. They weren't just imagining what might be. They were keeping watch all these years. They were always letting us know what should have been in the public domain. Why? Because they want us to remember what's at stake. Here today is that team. And the first speaker today is the founder of that Center for the Study of Public Domain. He is a co-founder of Creative Commons. He literally wrote the book, The Public Domain, and you can download it because he published it under Creative Commons license. Please welcome law professor, watchdog, visionary, Professor James Boyle. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thanks to, thanks to everyone at the Internet Archive. Um, Thanks, Brewster. Thanks for the internet. It, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it, you know. Um, there, quite seriously, um, but for the labors collectively of the people in this room, there are many, um, you know who you are. The internet, as you know it, would not exist. Um, we will talk about that a little bit in the presentations. But I just want to pause and say that this is a, a, a time of celebration and a time also to venerate some of the, at least of my heroes. Um, so on October 27th, 1998, the world changed. Um, the world changed because in the Sonny Bono Term Extension Act, Congress once again retrospectively extended copyrights, hoping presumably to incentivize the dead to produce <laughs> some more. The graveyards must have been hopping that night. Um, what that meant was that they hit a pause button on the conveyor belt of works passing into the public domain. It just stopped. And for 21 years, not one work came into the public domain because its copyright term had expired. On January 1st, 2019, that conveyor belt started again. <laughs> what should we think about that law? I would argue that that law was one of the most sweeping restrictions of speech in the history of the United States of America. This wasn't banning Lady Chatterley's lover or James Joyce's Ulysses. This was taking a 20-year swath of culture and saying, hey, for the next 20 years, even though the vast amount of this is commercially available, you can't sing these songs, you can't recite these poems, you can't translate these books, 
You can't take these movies and put subtitles on them. You can't make a rock opera out of my short story. Stop. Stop speaking. Stop reusing. Stop remixing in order to incentivize perhaps half of 1% or 1% of the works that were there. Great job, Congress. Great job. It passed unanimously, of course. What we're going to do today is talk about, in the words of a song of my use, how did we get here? Like, how did this happen? What have we lost? What have we now gained? What can we now do? What must we do to make sure that this kind of restriction does not, in fact, expand, that copyright is not extended once again, that its limitations and exceptions which protect things like fair use or the idea expression distinction or the rights of computer programmers to innovate, that those don't disappear? How can we have private hacks like Creative Commons, like the Internet Archive's work in digitization, that actually seek to maximize the space of the commons, this shared space? So that's what we're talking about today, and the next panel, we're going to discuss it. I'm um, from, as, as Wendy said, the Duke Center for the Study of the Public Domain. Um, when we started it, there were many, many, many centers on intellectual property. Nobody apparently thought that it was worth studying the public domain, the, the red-headed stepchild of intellectual property. Our theory was that the public domain was as vital to creativity, to culture, as intellectual property was. Perhaps more important. What if someone were, what if a group were to study that? And so we will be talking to you today about that and talking about the ways in which we got where we are today and what we can concretely do about it. But also this is a party we're going to be celebrating. So it's my great honor to introduce the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain, um, who also happens to be my wife, um, Jennifer Jenkins. Um, Jennifer is my wife. She's also my co-author. She's the co-author of uh, an intellectual property book you can download for free, of course. Uh, she's the co-author of a couple of comic books, Bound by Law, which explains fair use to you, um, Theft, A History of Music, which is a 2,000-year-long uh, history of musical borrowing, remix in action, right? Um, and Jennifer is going to uh, give you a much better presentation about mine, about how we got here. Jennifer. Hubby. Um, I also want to thank Leela, whose name I just learned how to pronounce correctly, my apologies, and Tim and the Internet Archive and Brewster and Ryan and Creative Commons for putting this wonderful event together. Um, as James mentioned, I am the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. That's our logo there. He's actually standing on the shoulder of a giant. And as you can see, there are, there are other little guys standing on his shoulder as well. Um, part of my job today is to get this group who came out on a Friday for the grand reopening of the public domain to care about the public domain. I think that's the very definition of preaching to the choir. <laughs> We're in a church, apparently from 1923, so can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. <Woo! laughs> Why I care about the public domain? Why celebrate the public domain? Don't take it from me. Take it from Disney, because I think they may have made one or two movies that were inspired or based on works that were in the public domain. Alexandre Dumas, Kipling, just a few, Burroughs, English folklore, The Ballad of Mulan, many public domain works featured in Fantasia, Dickens, uh, De Villeneuve, Jules Verne, Lewis Carroll, A Thousand and One Nights. Oh, I got more, Brother Grimm, <laughs> Hugo. <laughs> Charles Perrault, <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen, <laughs> Carlo Collodi, <laughs> Charles Perrault again, I mean. and yes, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, who was in favor of perpetual copyright. That is a young Elijah Wood, by the way, well before Hobbiton. 
Um, I'm not trying to trash on Disney here. In fact, Disney is making the case for me about how wonderful the public domain is because they were able to create these beautiful films. And Disney often gets unfairly blamed entirely for the Sonny Bodo Copyright Term Extension Act in 98, when in fact they were one of many voices pushing for this legislation. My point being that the public domain has consequences. Consequences not just for creativity, but also, as many people in this room know, for access. The copyright term lasts so darn long that by the time works enter the public domain, the vast majority of them are no longer commercially valuable and have not been for some time. Michael is gonna talk about works that we've lost entirely that didn't survive their copyright term. But even with works that still did survive, they've been forgotten. They're out of print. They're out of circulation. They're languishing in back catalogs. When those works enter the public domain, libraries and archives such as, oh, I don't know, the Internet Archive, can make those works available online without having to worry about lawsuits, <laughs> where anyone can rediscover these forgotten works and breathe new life into them. The link between the public domain and access is not just theoretical. In fact, empirical work by Professor Paul Heald, I don't know if he's here or whether I'm pronouncing his name right, and others have proven that when books enter the public domain, they're more likely to be in print. They're more likely to be available. They're likely to be cheaper in more editions and more formats, importantly, braille and audio formats. So we're celebrating the public domain because of its contributions to creativity, its contributions to access, and many of you are partying like it's 1923. I didn't get the memo. I could have bought, I could have bought a flapper dress. Yes, works from 1923 are finally free for us to find, for us to use, for us to build upon. I've been lovingly writing this public domain day site for 10 years now, and every year I've had to write it in the subjunctive, because it's like, happy public domain day. Nothing's going into the public domain, but here's what could have gone into the public domain. So it was a little strange this year actually celebrating works that were going into the public domain. This is our montage. If you Google Duke Public Domain Day, um, you can see the works that we're featuring. Uh, we didn't know about the Book of Mugshots. Great. Um, so a lot of you have been enjoying the works from 1923 already here today. I'll highlight one of them, speaking of choirs. Um, Robert Frost's collection of poems, New Hampshire, that includes the poem, beautiful poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Why did I mention choir? Eric Whitaker, the brilliant composer of the virtual choir works, and if you haven't listened to them, you need to Google them, go to YouTube this evening and watch them. Um, he was commissioned to write a choral work based on stopping by woods on a snowy evening in honor of a couple who had died within weeks of each other after 50 years of marriage. And it was their daughter who asked him to write the work because it was her favorite poem. He wrote it, he loved it, she loved it, he got a nasty gram from Frost's estate and publishers sternly forbidding him from using the poem. So he had to bury his piece. The next Eric Whitaker is not going to face that frustration, or anyone who wants to translate the poem, or turn it into a film, or turn it into a rock opera, which would be strange, but sure. <laughs> um, so, yes, so we are celebrating, we're educating, we're motivating, but the celebration has an asterisk. We had to wait 95 years for these works to enter the public domain. That's a really long time. Under the terms that we had until 1978, an initial term of 28 years, renewable for another 28 years, 56 years, we could be partying. Oh, I forgot a slide. I'm going to get there. Um, Jennifer, we would like more detail on those works from 1923. Aren't you an academic? Didn't you do additional research? There's a spreadsheet on our website with thousands of works, and you want some data on these works from 1923? We got the author, we got the name, we got the publication date, we got the renewal information. So we have a spreadsheet on our site that my assistant, Balfour Smith, took the entire year combing through the catalog of copyright entries to put together. So you want to see some other works from 23? They're on our website. Yay, Balfour. <laughs> Under that 56-year term that we had until 1978, we could party like it's 1962. You look pretty good, and I think some of those 1962 clothes, Brewster. Um, 
the works that would have entered the public domain this year, it's a bumper crop. Just look at some of them. The book, A Wrinkle in Time, Lawrence of Arabia, The Longest Day, the song, Dylan's song, Blowing in the Wind. Um, we have cataloged these on our website. The books in particular, we have Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? We have A Clockwork Orange. We have The Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions. We have Something Wicked This Way Comes. We could be partying like it's 1962, but that's not all. Because as I mentioned, you used to have to renew to maintain your copyright. After the first 28 years, studies show that 85% of authors, publishers did not renew, in most cases because the works were no longer commercially valuable. 93% of books did not renew. What that means is that we could be partying like it's 1990. <laughs> <laughs> No, we wouldn't be getting these works, because these works were successful, and they probably would have renewed. But I wanted to show them to you anyway. <laughs> We'd be getting the other 85% of works that didn't have the brilliance, staying power, cultural impact of MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This. <laughs> so we would be partying like it's 1990. So, Professor Borrell, I'm calling my own husband Professor Borrell. <laughs> We talk to students, right? Hubby yes. is going to talk a little about, yeah, the public domain is immensely valuable. We love it. That's what we all gather here. But it's really been shrinking. This is not like an exact representation. I didn't do the math. But let's just suffice to say it's been shrinking exponentially. So the good news is the freeze, the 20-year freeze on the public domain is over. And we can get in, woo we can get in our time machine. We can go back to 1923. Read them freely, and you may. Share them, and you may, I say. And to that, I say amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Young Michael? No, introduce him. Huh? Okay, so, yes. Now I am introducing, do you have a title slide that I can No, I, I, do not, I do not have a title slide. Okay. You just advance. Well, so Dr. Seuss, <laughs> and so we are lucky enough to have with us at the center now Michael Wolf, former executive director of the Authors Alliance, one of the most brilliant students that we've ever had at Duke Law School. And we're thrilled to have Michael joining us and telling us about, so I know celebrate, educate, motivate, this is kind of the tragic part of the public domain, but it blows people's minds about the works that didn't make it through their copyright term and are lost forever. Thank you. Michael. Got it. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks uh, to the Internet Archive Creative Commons. It is such a joy to be in San Francisco, to be, uh, to be back here. Uh, and speaking about my, my, one of my favorite things, what's motivated me through my, my professional career. Um, I have lost my mic. I can just belt it out if it's. Is that fine? Can can people hear me? No. Can people hear me now? <laughs> huh. Well. Hmm. Yeah. I, a handheld would do fine. Perfect. Oh, oh, and uh, oh, it. Are we are we good? No. You know. No. Oh no. This is why I prepared a dance routine. <laughs> I, I, I can give a sermon. Um. <laughs> uh, um. uh. I, I'm happy to proceed, but... Ah. <laughs> He's, 
I can't, I can't. I think you're just going to have to yell. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm hearing yell. I'm hearing don't yell. Um, <laughs> No, no, I don't think they're all they're all, they're all gone. <laughs> there are, um, for my next trick. I'm going to sing the national anthem while drinking this glass of water. <laughs> Hello? No. I just feel like I need to speak every couple of minutes to just to just to, just a test. I've got if if you have other funnies, let me know because I'm. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, um thirty five minutes on. Testing. I, I, I'm a reasonably loud person, and I'm happy to go for it. Woo! All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, we are going to do this like it's 1923, uh, which also gives me an excuse to be as enthusiastic as I have to be to reach the people in the back. Yeah. So, one of the things that is great about Public Domain Day is the treasure hunt, which we've seen from, uh, from Jennifer's slides of combing through the past and finding those things that are just so awesome that are, it's a moment of rediscovery. They've, they've been there, we know they've been there, uh, but we found them again. And what better experience is there than that? So, I, I wanted to show a few of my favorite things, uh, engage in a little bit of treasure hunting of my own, uh, and uh, having done so, I, uh, I came up a little blank. Um, not, not because there isn't cool stuff. We know there's lots of cool stuff. Jennifer's shown it. It's just not all of it is really quite in the public domain. Uh, so today is a celebration. I am here to celebrate. Uh, but sometimes you have to celebrate your fallen comrades. Those who cannot be with us here today, because they did not quite make the long trek from 1923 to, 20, to 2019 entirely intact. Now, some of those works that can't be with us here today uh, are still around, at least, we think. Uh, they're alive in some sense. They're just held in stasis. Um, this is a photograph of a library archives restricted collections section. Things that are subject to donor agreements or 
Uh, you might also think of unique or rare items that are individually possessed or, uh, and under tight restrictions. The public domain, insofar as you're just talking about the lapse of copyright protection, well, that doesn't necessarily get you access to do all the cool stuff you want to do with our cultural record with, with the public domain. So we have those works that are forbidden. A bigger problem, the sadder problem, the focus of my, my brief talk here, are, are those things that are just not found. Uh, the, I'm 404. Uh, 95 years? It's a long time. A lot can happen. Fire can happen. Uh, somebody made a fire joke, and I almost, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was Ryan, and I, if I'm, when I'm in this building, I almost don't want to say it, much less put it on a big slide. Uh, it turns out burning is still incredibly destructive for the cultural record, or it can be. Uh, sometimes fires are intentional, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes they're accidental. Sometimes it's the author uh, who wants to destroy their works, and under copyright law, generally that is their prerogative. Uh, or really copyright has nothing to say with it. it. It's their prerogative. If Franz Kafka says burn it, well, if Franz Kafka tells you to burn his books, ignore him. Uh, which, luckily, uh, his, uh, his friend and associate, Max Broad, did. And that's the only reason we still have most of Kafka. Um, and of course, fire also happens for malicious reasons. For the uh, deliberate, intentional erasure of the cultural record. And God knows the 21st century has, or the 20th century has seen plenty of that and there might be more still to come uh, ahead, no escaping it. Sometimes things just hit the dump. Uh, this image might be familiar to, to some of you. This is the uh, Atari dumping ground at Almogordo, where they took those ET cartridges of the games that nobody wanted to play and buried them in the earth. Now, ET would not be in the public domain anyway, and mercifully, thanks to the hardworking archivists of places like the Internet Archive, you can still play ET. Uh, don't, but you can. But it, it still signifi signifies something, which is, it turns out when things aren't profitable, often the best place to put them is the dump. And the owner of the copyright, the owner of the particular copy, isn't necessarily the one who is stewarding it for its long-term posterity. Uh, perhaps the biggest problem of all is just rot. And rot can be the literal decomposing of organic matter. Uh, it can be the poor preservation of digital things. Uh, stuff falls apart. Entropy takes control. Uh, film in particular is notorious. The nitrate films that were used in the early 20th century are not built to stick around. So if you shut them up in a particularly a non-temperature controlled environment uh, and leave them alone, they start to look like this. They become brittle, uh, they become faded, uh, and eventually they just turn into unusable, unviewable garbage that you probably, well, keep it around maybe, but it might just end up with those Atari uh, cartridges. Of particular moment here, uh, of a, if on this particular public domain day, where we're celebrating 1923, <laughs> hallelujah, uh, <laughs> and we have a backup. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to, I'll, I'm going to try to resist the urge to yell because I've been programmed to do it, and now it's hard. Uh, this pu Public Domain Day is particularly special for works of film and particularly silent cinema. The heyday of silent cinema was roughly, of American silent feature film was roughly 1912 through 1929, and that's what this chart represents, taken from a Library of Congress study commissioned on the subject. The bits in, I know you can't see the key, it's a little bit far, but the bits in red represent the, those films that are completely lost. The bits in the north that are multicolored, those are ones that we still have. Not necessarily completely, but we still possess in some partial form. There's a lot more red than the other stuff. 70% is presently believed to be completely lost. It's hard to prove the negative. There, might be some left that could change those figures, but from where we stand now, it looks pretty bleak. How did we get there? Ooh. Wholesale destruction. These are all quotes from that report. From movie studios finding it cheaper, more expedient to throw things in the dump. 
uh, and willful disposal. Near total loss by fires. Two of the film archives of the early movie studios, the major film archives, were completely and utterly destroyed by our friend fire. Uh, and all of this is in relatively minor compared to just the problem of rot. Those, those factors combined, coming together, means that we, are, we have already lost much or most of American silent cinema well before it ever made it to the public domain. Lest you think that this is some old-timey problem, that this is the, the Charleston of uh, cultural loss, it's not. We still lose things. Uh, slightly more recently, uh, the Super Bowl, Super Bowl I, the first one, uh, was not retained by the NFL. It wasn't retained by anybody. The only copy is in private hands, and the NFL doesn't particularly want to pay for it, but they've threatened to sue if anything else is done with the film. So it's either give it to me for free, friends, or we'll sue you. <laughs> so as far as in, in our current moment, you cannot watch at the Super Bowl one, not really. Doctor Who fans in the room? Come on, this is a geeky crowd. Yeah! Those early seasons took place in an era where the BBC had a practice of re-recording over old uh, other tapes. They were working as public stewards. They weren't wasting taxpayer money. Well, you're gonna, don't let that perfectly good tape sit idly by. 97 of 253 Doctor Who episodes from the show's first six seasons are missing. Occasionally they, they reappear, but uh, in the present moment, not looking great. The amazing thing is that by the standards of its contemporaries, this figure is pretty good. Doctor Who is a popular show. People went out of their way to try and save it. This is what good preservation looks like uh, when you're looking half a century or more down, uh, down the pike. Now, one of the happy moments here, and one of the reasons that this is a celebration, is that this loss is not necessarily permanent. Stuff does come back. Uh, this uh, uh, particular film reel of a Doctor Who episode was unearthed. Uh, much, much of American silent cinema has been found in, warehoused in uh, the Czech Republic. There are literally uh, holes dug into the, uh, the earth in the Yukon Territory. The end of the line for the traveling, uh, uh, traveling reel-to-reel or films uh, that were going from town to town got to the Yukon. They weren't going to come back. Put them in the earth. This stuff is out there. It's now a literal treasure hunt. If you want to find the missing public domain, the unknown public domain, you have to go and do some sleuthing. You have to do some digging. You have to get your hands dirty. Uh, at the end of the day, it might be worth it because now it's 2019. The public domain is opening back up, and if you find it, you can do cool stuff with it that you might not have been able to do before. So that's worth celebrating, and it's also worth just tipping our hat to the stuff that we know is not coming back. Some stuff just won't. So here's to you, public domain, known or unknown. We're going to celebrate the hell out of you today either way. Uh, cheers. Maybe I'll stay here. Um, <laughs> that was amazingly good performance. I, I've only seen one tech failure um, worse than that, which is Jennifer gave a presentation on um, copyright infringement suits, uh, uh, things like Blurred Lines, where uh, there were claims that one song infringed another. Of course, the entire presentation is playing the songs, and she went to the World of Bluegrass Festival, and I said, have you checked the AV? She said, sweetheart, of course, it's the Bluegrass Festival. I think they can do the AV. That, of course, cursed her. There was no sound system at all. <laughs> so she got there. There was no PowerPoint. There was no, I would have thrown a Scottish fit. I would have had hissy fits on the stage. She said, your singers, sing it. And they sang it. So th that's the only thing I can imagine better than um, what Michael did there. So I'm going to talk to you about the, um, uh, the architecture of the, um, okay, I'm going to talk about the architecture of the public domain. Um, so the, um, how did we get here? The, um, you've heard about the 1998 Act. The 1998 Act extended copyrights retrospectively by 20 years, and that was bad. Um, it was bad particularly because the vast majority of, of works 
were works that weren't commercially available. So it did no good for all of those works, right? And yet it put them off limits. But an even more significant change in the architecture of the public domain um, happened earlier. It happened on January 1st, 1978. On that day, the 1976 Copyright Act came into force, and it made some really vital changes to the architecture of the public domain. Believe it or not, before the 1976 Act, 99.9% .9 of all works ever created went into the public domain. Why? Because if you wrote a love poem, if you made a home movie, if you wrote a diary, and you didn't file a copyright registration, that work was in the public domain immediately. It went immediately into the public domain. Only the tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of works where people wanted commercial protection were protected. So the public domain, which had been this sort of enormous thing, suddenly shrinks because now all of informal culture, all of your love letters, all of your diaries, all of your home movies, goes into copyright if you don't specifically say not, and it's very hard to do that. When Larry Lessig founded Creative Commons, he asked the Copyright Office, how do you put things in the public domain? And they said, quote, we don't provide that service. We're about locking shit up, right? We're not about like making it free, even when the creator chooses to. One reason why Creative Commons exists. The second thing they did was it used to be that to get a copyright, you had to apply, and then you had to renew, as Jennifer said. And 85% of all copyright owners said, no thanks. And it cost like $6. It wasn't like a, an enormously difficult thing to do. It wasn't worth it to them. So 85% of stuff that was 28 years old went into the public domain. All of informal culture plus 85% of stuff that is um, 28 years uh, old or more. So all of that went into the public domain. So just think how enormous that public domain is. That was the change in the architecture of the public domain. Now those are causes of sadness. But there's also some causes for happiness. The thing is, we're talking here about copyright term. That's just one of the dimensions of the public domain. The public domain is also all of the places where copyright is limited. Copyright never covers facts or ideas. Those go immediately into the public domain. The facts in my book, the ideas in my book, they're yours from day one. That's a really important feature of American copyright law which people have sometimes tried to change. Oh, let's have database rights. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know, science maybe? Um, right, like what a great idea. What a fabulous idea. Let's lock shit up without knowing what will happen, right? Um, how about, um, now this is gonna get pretty technical. I know not all of you are lawyers. So Pamela Samuelson sitting in the audience is involved with a case involving the question of whether or not APIs are copyrightable, uh, application programming interfaces. They're the way that you operate a computer program, and they're necessary for interoperability. Now, this is the technical part. Pam, this is a brilliant theory of her, she's a brilliant uh, law professor, thinks that these aren't copyrightable because they're methods of operation, they're the way you operate the computer program, and the Copyright Act says, and I quote, copyright will never extend to methods of operation. Now, I know that was hard, um, but a complicated idea, right? And um, um, some courts have agreed, some courts sadly have not. We need to keep fighting that fight. We need to keep resisting the urge to privatize government data. In the United States, under Section 105 of the Copyright Act, anything that the federal government produces is yours at cost of reproduction. That's awesome. Other countries don't do that. Lots of companies will go, yeah, but that means you're competing with us. We'd rather get your shit for free, but have nobody else able to get it. That's something we have to keep protecting. We also have to engage with the various methods by which the public domain is renewed in ways by the choice of creators. Ryan's sitting there, Creative Commons is a private hack which says if the public domain is denied to us, we will allow creators to make a choice how they exercise their own copyright. I have to say, I looked over to that part of the audience and goes, God, these people are stone-faced. <laughs> I'm getting no laughter from over here. I, I was actually kind of freaking me out. Come on, guys, break a smile. Um, <laughs> what we have here is something where there are many dimensions of this fight. There are private hacks. There are attempts fully to utilize the limitations and exceptions in the Copyright Act. The Internet Archive is involved in some of those, right? Aggressively maintaining fair use. Fair use is like a muscle 
If you do not flex it, it goes away. This is actually true under American copyright law, because then people say, well, I'm going to ask you for a license now, and eventually if enough um, spineless university council give in to that, then they'll say, look, there's a market, and if there's a market, you're harming the market, and now it's not a fair use. We've got to keep policing the boundaries of fair use. This is all protecting the public domain. How did we get here? It wasn't just Disney. It wasn't just even um, people buying Congress critters, though there was a lot of that. It was a failure of the collective imagination. Larry Lessig, who's going to be speaking soon, argued Eldred versus Ashcroft in front of uh, the United States Supreme Court, saying that the copyright term extension retrospectively was unconstitutional for two reasons. It wasn't promoting the progress of the science of the useful arts, and it was also an impingement on freedom of speech, with the American public getting nothing back. Later, in a case called Golan, uh, the US Congress decided to take stuff out of the public domain and put it back under copyright. And Justice Ginsburg, I hope she's doing well, she's a wonderful person, and we all pray for her recovery. On copyright, we disagree somewhat. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg said, we don't understand the idea that you have vested rights in the public domain. How could you have vested rights in the public domain? There's no rights to the public domain. She could conceive of no relationship to the public domain other than individual ownership. Is that the way you feel about these 1923 works? They're mine, baby. Well, let me tell you, I wrote the book, The Public Domain, and I trademarked that. So if I see any of you using that phrase, I'm coming after you. We have to change our consciousness. We have to make people realize, just as the environmentalists said, hey, you know, development isn't the only thing. There's also this idea of protecting the environment, and it links together all of these struggles. We have to have an environmentalism for the public domain that first names its contributions to our collective culture and then defends them. That's ultimately the biggest challenge. In 1998, when copyright term was extended, the copyright term that finally today is ending, very few people spoke for the public domain. Who will speak for the public domain? Who will say, no, this is the, my future, my kids getting textbooks in school, this is my youth orchestra being able to play this, I want to be able to re-choreograph that, I want to be able to make a braille version of that book, I want to adapt that movie, I want to build on it and make a new version, and that links together librarians, and software engineers, and people doing archival research on life under segregation who can't use Super 8 video reels from the time because they're like, I don't know, there might be a copyright owner. And after all, even informal culture is copyrighted. All of these people have an interest in the public domain. Today, we celebrate that interest. We also have to help our friends, our fellow citizens, and our kids understand why it's important. Thank you very much. So I think you guys leave. All right, let's give it up for the team for the Center for the Study of Public Domain. Especially Mike, who was a great vamper here. I'm going to ask our next speaker to come up and get set up. But while he's getting set up, Jamie, will you come and stand with me? Because you know this guy, I think, a little bit. You know, we've hung around, yeah. Yeah, you hung around. I mean, he hardly needs an introduction, right? I mean, he's, he, how many of you went to law school in part because of Larry Lessig? <laughs> right? Oh, one. Well, thank you. Two. Okay, good, Larry. You got two. We know him to be the founder of the Creative Commons, a Harvard Law professor. He, he ran for president. Would that he had won. But you know the... the the inner workings of Larry Lessig. Tell us a little bit about that, Larry Lessig. I want you to know, she insisted I do this. Um, <laughs> Larry, I'm saying this to Larry. Um, Larry's one of the most amazing people I've ever met because he has a reality distortion field, which lots of people have, but his works. So in setting up Creative Commons, Larry would repeatedly say to us, look, we'll just run out over the stage above the pews to the back. And we go, but we'll fall. And Larry goes, no, it'll be fine if we, if we run fast. And we would go, I don't think that, there you go, no, trust me, it'll work. And it did. Um, I'll tell you one story and then and we'll let Larry talk. There was um, 
when, when Creative Commons started, I wanted to have a single license that applied everywhere in the world, just like the GPL. And Larry said, no, we'll have a license for every country in the world. And I said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my entire life. Microsoft couldn't do that. Google you know, was barely in existence. Google couldn't do that. IBM couldn't do that. You'd need the best lawyers in every country in the world to adapt these licenses, not just to their language, but to their legal system. And their legal systems are wildly different. This is a crazy idea. I was objectively correct. right? He had invited me to run across in open air. And he said, no, it'll work. Trust me. And what happened was we went to all of these lawyers, these amazing people, these artists in other countries, and said, hey, we have a problem. They said, we got you. And suddenly we had hundreds of thousands of unpaid volunteers around the world who wanted to solve our problem, which he had created, by the way, by not having a single license. And they were all really excited about Creative Commons. I was right. It was an incredibly stupid idea that succeeded magnificently. Yes. Thank you. And that's, so, I think that's more I've, than enough story. So all of you will have questions for Larry Lessig. There are cards in the pews and pens. If you would write down your question very legibly, there will be people going around to collect them, and we'll bring them up to him. So without further ado, thank you, Jamie. Please welcome Professor Larry Lessig. Thank you. It is wonderful to be here today to celebrate the extraordinary gift that the law has allowed us to have our culture back. But it is way too long that we have been waiting for this moment. It is wonderful that this work now enters the public domain. In an old day, we would have said, we can now rip, mix, and burn this work. We should celebrate, we should share, we should build upon, we should now preserve these things that have been given back to us. But it is fucking absurd. <laughs> That's a technical legal term. It's fucking absurd that it took 20 years to get here. And I think what we have to do is learn a bit. It's good what we can learn. I don't mean the things that we will learn are good things. I just mean it's good that we have learned something from these 20 years. So let's think back to then. There was a man who was our president then, you might remember, one score and 90 years ago today, this man signed into law this statute, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. This statute had been fought by many extraordinary people, some who are not here, Dennis Karyala, who was an extraordinary law professor who did everything he could to stop this statute, some of whom are here, Pam Samuelson, who did everything she could to stop this statute, but they lost, which means we lost. Congress put a pause on the public domain. And then I read a story about a man who said hell with that, Eric Eldred, who said, I want to publish this works despite the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. I'm going to put Robert Frost's poems up on the internet. I don't care about the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. And I went to Eric and I said, Eric, Eric, let us challenge this statute in your name. Let us go to the Supreme Court and say to the Supreme Court, look, Congress has a power, but it's a limited power. And that court, I said, Eric, is filled with people who believe in interpreting the Constitution according to the framers' vision, and they will give you a victory. Eric, you don't have to threaten yourself with prosecution. So he said yes, and we took this case to the Supreme Court, and of course, we lost, or I lost. I lost some faith. Faith in the good faith 
of those who had said so often before that they were committed to an idea regardless of the politics, the idea, this constitution, that these conservatives said would be read according to our framers. These conservatives in that case of Eldred versus Ashcroft sat silently as those who didn't believe in reading the constitution according to the framers vision, Justice Ginsburg, and then the dissenters, Justice Stevens and Justice Breyer, fought out the stupidity of this extension, this pause on the public domain. That was an incredible loss. But you know, from that loss, an extraordinary amount of good came. So many people were pissed off <laughs> after that loss. <laughs> so many people were so angry at this freedom not given that they began to say this freedom needs to be taken taken back. It's from that loss that Creative Commons was born. It's from that loss that these extraordinary organizations began to build what is the movement, the free culture of movement that today celebrates the fight to make this work and freedom universal. Maybe never would that movement have taken off if we had won. Maybe. Now, one of the soldiers in that movement, one of the inspirations in that movement was a boy named Aaron Swartz. He was there at the very beginning. So, uh, who are you and why are you here at the Eldred argument? This doesn't make sense. I am Aaron Swartz and I'm here to listen to the Eldred, to see the Eldred argument. Why did you fly out? And he was at the beginning of- Now that you've seen the theory behind Creative Commons, it's time to show you some of the practice. So when you come to, your, come to our website here, and you go to choose license, it gives you this list of options, it explains what it means. And then after Creative Commons, he came to work with Brewster to build the Open Library Project. He was a soldier in the fight for free culture. And then about 2010, he decided he wanted to move on. He decided that he wanted to move to the fight for a more progressive politics. So he stopped his work on free culture. He started an organization called Demand Progress. That organization began to fight with who he thought would be a progressive president, a man named Barack Obama, and to think that through this progressive president we could get policies that he thought the nation needed, healthcare policies and policies about global warming. But in the September of 2010, Aaron got an email. Here, I'll let him tell you so that me, story. It all started with a phone call. It was September, not last year, but the year before that, September 2010. And I got a phone call from my friend Peter. Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill that you have to take a look at. Well, what is it, I said. It's called COICA, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeiting Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right, maybe Hollywood is right, but either way, what's the big deal? I'm not gonna waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright, healthcare, financial reform. Those are the issues that I work on. Not something obscure like copyright law. Now you can imagine Aaron feeling as he was getting this email something like uh, maybe this. Just when I thought I was out. They pull me back in. And he wrote me an email, and he said that he was planning this fight against Koika, uh, and he wanted me to join him, and I had a similar reaction to that. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. So he said, is there anything that, he could, that I could do to help him with Koika? And I wrote back, uh, Koika, is that a virus? <laughs> He responded, the internet censorship bill close enough, but what he did was to fight this bill, the Koika uh, bill, because this statute had this extraordinary ability to make the Constitution disappear. What this statute promised was that the Attorney General could, without any due process, take down websites because there was an allegation of copyright infringement. 
And so what Demand Progress did was to organize this fight against the copyright uh, um, uh, La Coica, and in the Judiciary Committee, they succeeded in stopping the bill, and it never went to the Senate floor. That was a pretty incredible victory. <clears throat> but then, of course, like Jason in Friday the 13th, it came back, and it came back in the form of something called SOPA, or PIPA which was a new version of this same bad idea, and it triggered another new movement to fight it. And leaders such as Senator Wyden began to push hard to get this bill stopped in Congress. And as they moved to build the movement, they moved without believing they would ever win. This is an important point. They didn't believe they would win, they just knew the fight was right. So they took it up, believing there was no chance because almost 65 senators had signed a letter saying they were supporting Koika and then Pippa and then Sopa. It seemed impossible to imagine Congress pulling back from that, but the fact it was impossible didn't mean it was not something they should fight for, so they fought. And slowly, they built support all across the internet. And then that support grew dramatically. And organizations like Wikipedia and Reddit uh, began to join the fight and threaten to shut down the internet if they didn't stop SOPA and PIPA. And then they did stop SOPA and PIPA for an even more incredible victory. Here's. Aaron describing and that victory. Hard as it was for me to believe, after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had happened. We did it. We won. And then we started rubbing it in. <laughs> you all know what happened next. Wikipedia went black. Reddit went black. Craigslist went black. The phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements, retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. And it was just ridiculous. I mean, th there's a chart from the time that captures it pretty well. It says something like January 14th on one side. And it has this big, long list of names supporting the bill. And then just a few lonely people opposing it. And then on the other side, it says January 15th. And now it's totally reversed. Everyone is opposing it. Just a few lonely names still hanging on in support. I mean, this really was unprecedented. Don't take my word for it, but ask former Senator Chris Dodd, now the chief lobbyist for Hollywood. He admitted after he lost that he had masterminded the whole evil plan. And he told the New York Times he'd never seen anything like it during his many years in Congress. And everyone I've spoken to agrees. The people rose up and they caused a sea change in Washington. Not the press, which refused to cover the story. Just coincidentally, their parent companies all happened to be lobbying for the bill. Not the politicians, who were pretty much unanimously in favor of it. And not the companies who had all but given up trying to stop it and decided it was inevitable. It was really stopped by the people. This was a victory that was an inspiring victory for him. It changed his whole view of what he would do. It was from this moment that he was convinced everything in the rest of his life would be committed to the politics of rallying people to fight these, for these changes. And the lesson he took from this was not just about copyright, as Wyden said in response to after this victory. What we've seen in the last few weeks from the grassroots is a time for the history books. The win is a triumph over very powerful special interests. That triumph produced a recognition that there was a more fundamental issue here, and that issue was the basic corruption of our political process. Now, Aaron had triggered me on that corruption about five years before. Aaron came to visit me when I was writing what would be the last book I would write about copyright, a book called Remix. 
And I was excited to share with him the book. I was about to give my first TED talk about copyright, and I was excited to talk to him about that. And he was not excited at all <laughs> about the book or the TED talk. And he said to me, how do you ever think you're going to make progress on these issues? So long as there's this basic corruption in our government. And you know, I was kind of miffed. I wanted him to be excited with me about these exciting things that I was working on. I thought we were making real progress, but I pushed back. I said to him, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. Not my field, corruption. My field is internet, culture, and copyright. And he said, you mean, as an academic, it's not your field? And I said, yeah, Aaron, as an academic, it's not my field. And he said, well, what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And this was the way he was. His questions could hug like a mother's hug and pull a recognition however hard you wanted to deny it. And of course, from that recognition at that moment, he and I agreed that he and I would join and we would work on this corruption problem together and I would give up the work I was doing on copyright. And from that moment in 2006, I had shifted my field to this field I now pursue here. But Aaron's work as a citizen was different. Shortly after that, Aaron was speaking at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and this is what he said. Everything up to now, all of those journals, all that scientific legacy going back to the Enlightenment, that's still behind locked gates. But you, you have a key to those gates. And with a little bit of shell script magic, you can get those journal articles. You can download copies of them. And once you have a copy, theoretically, you could make it available to everyone. And if you don't know how to make it available to everyone without getting caught, you can go to guerrillaopenaccess.com and find my mailing address. And hard drives that get sent there will find their way online. So Eric's obsession, Aaron's obsession began to focus on JSTOR. And he was focused on JSTOR obsessively because he had attended a conference in Budapest at which the question was asked, how much would it cost to liberate the JSTOR database? JSTOR, if you might not know, is a database of academic scholarship, an extraordinary resource of scholarship that had been published over hundreds of years, but collected and made accessible mainly to relatively wealthy Americans in American universities. And the idea that Aaron had in this question was, how do we make it available to everybody? What would it take? How much would it cost? And the answer was given a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> and that infuriated Aaron. And so shortly thereafter, he went to this university, building 16, and began to suck the JSTOR database down onto hard drives, ostensibly to make it available to others after he had collected the whole of the archive. He was arrested. Our government charged him with ultimately multiple felonies, all charging unauthorized access to this database. The US attorney proud to brag that she was threatening 34 years in prison for his downloading too many academic articles. Now, what was bizarre about this prosecution was that Aaron was on MIT's property. And MIT had something called the open access policy for its networks. 
So though he was being charged with unauthorized access to the network, MIT's policy was everybody had free access to the network. And so this system, which allowed anybody access, mean to, seemed to mean that it was possible that his unauthorized access was, in fact, authorized. And then as a study by the MIT University Council's office afterward concluded, even though he was technically authorized, the government never asked MIT whether he had been authorized. They never asked before they prosecuted him. And MIT didn't ask of itself whether he was authorized. So here, a prosecution of Aaron for his access authorized by the MIT policy was never questioned by the states or the university. Well, that gave his team, his legal team, hope. His lawyer told me he was optimistic that Aaron would not be convicted. But two years into this litigation, having spent all of his savings on the litigation, Aaron was not optimistic about the litigation. And six years and 14 days ago today, he ended his life. He left us. Shortly thereafter, it was discovered that the $250 million estimate to liberate JSTOR had been a mistake, a misunderstanding. And in fact, JSTOR would liberate its archive for a fraction of that, and of course, right now, has basically done that. OK, I have one more thought before I stop. So in the days before Aaron steered me away from working on copyright, I was working to complete this book remix. And when I would go around talking about this book remix, I would tell a story that was inspired by a certain remix. So many of you are familiar with this remix. You know the great movie, The Breakfast Club. You know the music of Listomania, of Phoenix, called Listomania. Somebody got the great idea, what if we remix these two together? They produced this. So sentimental. Okay, and so it's the nature of the internet, is the nature of what this frame had created, we saw from this creativity a kind of call and then response. So first in Brooklyn. So sentimental. And then San Francisco. San Francisco. So sentiment. And then soon you saw literally scores of these remixes spreading across YouTube. Amsterdam, Manila, Rio. I don't know what Cousins is, but anyway. The point is, everywhere. People were mimicking this creativity, this call and response in the spirit of remix. And I was going around the world talking about it, as I just have here with you. And then the fucking band Phoenix sued me. <laughs> no, seriously. They threatened to sue me because my videos use their music to talk about the way their music was being remixed by people all around the world. So I said, hell no. I called my friends at EFF, and we filed a countersuit against <laughs> the band. And very quickly, <laughs> the 
lawsuit was over, it was a victory. It was an important victory that we had, that they had made against this extremism. But of course, what we need to recognize is that not all people threatened in this context, in this way, have such victories. Not all enjoy the extraordinary legal support of a group like EFF. Of course, YouTube is littered with channels that have been shut down through copyright strikes, three strikes and you're out. People who've created and tried to make their creativity available and this constant fight by the copyright owners to restrict the freedom to create and remix has its effect. Many of us want to win and move on from these fights. The point is they never move on. They stay and they persist in their insistence that the picture of culture that we celebrate is the picture that they will stop. And that means our strategy here, I think, has got to be to learn a bit from the works of <clears throat> J.K. Rowling. Now, I, I cleared the permission to quote here, so don't worry, there won't be any force used when I do this. But you remember at the end of book six, this quote, it was important, Dumbledore said, <clears throat> to fight and fight again and keep fighting, for only then could evil be kept at bay, though never quite eradicated. That is what we must do. We must fight, yes, and fight, and fight again. Because the reality is that we are on the right side of history here, my friends, and never have I been more sure of that when, than when this whole little episode of Listomania was reminded to the culture we live in when it appeared in this form with these creators. Because of course, this extraordinary so woman was one of the people who I had seen so many times as I had told that story. And as we reflect on what that means, that one of the most powerful political leaders of the next 30 years is a woman who in her bones understands exactly what we have been fighting for. Some of us for 30 years, Pam Samuelson, for 30 years fighting for this cause. What we know is that what we know is true is increasingly becoming obvious and not just among people like us, but obvious everywhere. And the thing we need to worry about most is that 20 years from now, when somebody suggests we have another celebration of the Internet Archive to remember those days when we were fighting for the public domain, people will say, huh? Really? You had to fight for the public domain? And when that time comes, let me tell you, it will be wonderful again. But it is still true, it has taken way too long. I am so grateful to the work that everybody here has done and the fights that all of us have been engaged in will be fights we will celebrate for the rest of our lives as the obviousness becomes unavoidable. And the work that's been done here at this archive by the people here who celebrate the 20, 20th anniversary of the pause being placed by celebrating the future, well, there will never be a pause on the public domain again. That work is inspirational to all of us. Thank you so much for what you've done and for the celebration you engaged today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewster. Thank you.
Larry, we have some questions from the audience. Okay, I have answers. Dear Lawrence, how do we proceed with global copyright reform for the benefit of humanity? Well, the truth is that it only happens if we stop the United States from being the most forceful force for oppression in this battle. You know, there are many people around the world who would like to unite in the fight to create a more reasonable, balanced system of copyright. Some places are completely surprising. I was in Russia. <laughs> There's an extraordinary movement in Russia of people trying to build another version of copyright that is more balanced and sensible than the one the United States interests push so hard. So the fight has to begin at home because we have the most power in this fight. And if we can get our government to become more sensible, then we can begin to prevail in that fight. And we only get our government to be more sensible if we find a way to restrain the power of special interest in our government, which is the fight Aaron started me on more than 12 years ago. But I'm optimistic, because I'm pretty sure people like AOC will be at the center of that fight that the idea of creating a copyright act as a more balanced, open project is something that will become more and more obvious to all in our government if we can at least get through this crisis. So there is a movement outside of the United States. We should enable it by fixing the damage that we're doing here in the United States. Here's a question from Ron. Is it possible to turn the clock back and reduce copyright terms? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's conceivable we could reduce copyright terms going forward, not immediately, but if we get to a place where it makes more, more responsive, more responsive to sensible copyright policy, it's possible to think about reducing it going forward. But those who have the rights right now do everything they can to defend what they now have. And we still don't have, in the United States government at least, any recognition of why that needs to be balanced with this conception of the public good. So it's possible, but it's something that, again, takes what I was told we had to do first, which is to fix our government. Here's another question. Larry, how do we deal with the competing forces of freedom of speech and free access versus personal property, political correctness, and privacy? Well, it's a really hard thing to get people to recognize how these are really very different fights. So I'm a big believer in the value of the First Amendment's free speech clause in understanding why we need to restrict the protections of copyright where they're doing no good, as Jamie was describing before, in the context where the only thing it's doing is restricting access without producing any good in, in, a, in an alternative. So I think the First Amendment's done real good there. But we need to recognize the First Amendment's also being used by corporations to restrict the ability of governments to regulate to advance things even like privacy or Network neutrality, one of the strong arguments made by cable companies is that network neutrality violates their First Amendment rights because it's forcing them to carry content they don't want to carry. Or in the context of privacy, First Amendment's banning our ability to regulate in the context of privacy because it's forcing companies to engage in the control of speech that they otherwise don't want to be engaged in. So this very same tool that is for the good also can be used for the bad. That there's this Janus face character of the First Amendment, like there's a Janus face character to the internet itself. So I think that the fight has got to be to separate these fights, to recognize the free speech fight for access to culture is a different fight from the questions of privacy. I think we need both privacy and these free speech rights, but getting there is going to take an extraordinary amount of 
work. Basically, the EFF needs about 10 times the budget it has right now. So if you want to give to the EFF right now, that would be really helpful. <laughs> We're in Silicon Valley, so we have a couple of technical questions for you. Do you think that blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum will help with the future of uncensorable data? Um, boy, there's so much in that. Um, so I think there's a natural way, there's a natural story, a natural progression here of the spread of blockchain technologies. Um, not just in the context of like bit, Bitcoin, but also in the more generic context that Ethereum is pushing towards where we imagine infrastructures of automatic enforcement, automatic law through code. You might say code is law. That might be a way to characterize that future. <laughs> and, and that struggle, that struggle to regulate that code is something governments are going to be keenly focused on because the world where technology automatically enforces the rules contrary to the policies of the government is not a world the governments are going to accept very easily or very uh, openly. So I, I do think that there is a natural way in which this future is unfolding and we should expect this to be an increasingly important part. But as I listen to the debates around the blockchain, it feels like deja vu all over again. Because the blockchain is the blockchain movement is filled with so many people who believe, boy, this will be the beautiful, perfect world where technology gives us our freedom. We aren't controlled or regulated by the government. It's like John Perry Barlow has returned in the debates around the blockchain. It's the same debate we were having 25 years ago around the internet. As people imagine the internet as a technology that would be a perfect libertarian space that would save us from the control of government. And what many were saying back then is what some are saying now about the blockchain. What many were saying back then was, look, you're never going to have a space that the government yields control over completely. And if you imagine you're going to build it without the government, they're going to come in and they're going to crudely and powerfully crush much of the hope and the potential and the freedom that this space could give you. And so that's the same truth with blockchain. It's not going to be a space that's unregulated. So we got to figure out how is it going to be that the freedom and potential of blockchain that can, can develop, recognizing that this requirement will continue, the government's insistence that it has a role to play here will continue. Professor Lessig, do you think that courts will ultimately rule that APIs are copyrightable? I have so much faith in Pam. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I mean, no, I don't. I mean, I think that she will win. And I think she will win in part because, you know, the funny thing is though the courts have given us a bunch of really terrible decisions. It's also true the courts have given us a bunch of incredible progress around the ideas of fair use. There's some Second Circuit still screwy in all sorts of ways, but if you think about, if you think about the Google Book case, you know the book, the Google Books case, which developed after Brewster had made, um, <coughs> begun to make the um, same technology available through the Internet Archive. When that happened. Based on the existing law at the time, most people were really skeptical that the courts would ever recognize a fair use right to do what Google Books eventually enabled, which was the snippet search. And, and if you compare the decision that ultimately decided that this use was fair use with the decisions of courts even just five years before, you could see that there had been progress in the courts. The courts had increasingly understood the importance of the other side. Part of that was because Courts are not subject to the copyright lobbies. They don't live, they don't depend on the money from Hollywood. So they're free to make a decision on the basis of what makes sense, not what pays for the campaign. So that's one reason why they can get it right. They also are filled with clerks who are taught by people like Jennifer and Jamie and Pam who have, who have learned the other side and then go to those judges and tell them, look, 
There's more to this story than just the copyright owners who need to be protected. So that progress is possible in courts in the way that still in the legislature, they don't even see the other side because they're paid not to see. So I, I, they, I, have, I have hope that in the courts, this balance will be struck. And uh, if it can happen there, then that becomes the foothold that we can fight in the legislature uh, more generally. Can you speak to the European GDPR and its impact on US laws? Yeah, so, <laughs> so the GDPR you know, is that statute which achieved that really important objective of making sure that whenever you go to a website, you have to click Yes, I know what cookies are, and I'm okay with the cookies. <laughs> right, I mean, so on the one hand, I'm all for figuring out how we can better protect privacy. But on the other hand, there are stupid ways to protect privacy, and there are less stupid ways to protect privacy. And forcing us to go through this ritual that says, yeah, yeah, yeah I've read the cookies, and uh, the cookie policy, and I'm okay with it, doesn't, in my view, help us protect privacy. What it does is convince people that there's a whole bunch of uses here that they don't really understand, and that's just the way the world is. I think we have to be more open to the idea that privacy is not going to be protected by creating the, 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 the fantasy that individuals are going to choose the right set of protections and protect themselves against the wrong set of protections. Instead, privacy is going to be protected when government starts saying, here's legitimate uses, and here are illegitimate uses, and the space between, we might have to try to get people's affir affirmation before their data can be used in that way. I think what's bizarre in this space is that we believe that if we just give individuals choice, the right answer will be created. But, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't know anything about really <laughs> what these policies are saying, because I don't, frankly, have the time to read them. So when you say to me, have I agreed to your policy, and I say, yes, let me tell you, I'm lying to you. <laughs> and you're lying to me, and you're lying to everybody. We're all lying. We're all living this lie, this constant perpetual lie. We experience, we go through our life lying all the time. You know, there was a time when you didn't have to do that. I, I kind of remember a time where I, you could go through life and do what you needed to do without constantly engaging in this ritual of lying. Um, and, and, and that's the reality that this method, this way of thinking about privacy has produced, and I just think we need to get beyond it. We need to be open about saying, it's going to be hard to figure out which uses should not be permitted, and which uses should clearly be permitted, and which uses we should try to figure out whether somebody has really opted into, that's going to be a hard thing to figure out. I get it. But unless we start doing that, unless we start putting some things off the table and some things that are easy so we can narrow those places where we need people to affirm them, we're going to live in this space where there is no real protection. And that lack of real protection will really matter as our data becomes this commodity that defines us, that sells us, as we try to live in the context of the internet. I think I've got one more question. That's the only one I'm going to answer. So we got one more? One more. That's it. Are you planning to run for president oh, in 2020? <laughs> 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 so the answer is, I am planning to do whatever the fuck I can to get us a government that actually represents us. That's what I'm planning on doing. But right now, I'll tell you, I'm free from the burden of running for president, and that's the way I hope things remain. But thank you so much for everything you've done, Brewster and Pam and Jamie and everybody who's organized this, including Creative Commons that, Jamie, we started. I didn't start Creative Commons. And uh, this is an extraordinary celebration. I'm so happy to watch with all of us as this develops across the day. Thank you. Let's hear it for Larry Lessig. We have a special surprise couple of guests. So while we're changing back the computers, I want to bring up two remarkable artists. 
DJ Spooky and Greg Niemeyer. Oh, is it just DJ Spooky? Oh, no, here you both are. DJ Spooky knows Larry Lessig from the good old days, but he has a world premiere happening tonight at the Uruguayna Center for the Arts. It's called Quantopia. Come on up, both of you. We are so proud. Hey, we are so proud. A year ago, we commissioned a new work about the history, the meaning, the evolution of the internet with composition by DJ Spooky, Paul Miller, and visuals by Greg Niemeyer. It's funded by the Hewlett 50 Commissions, the Hewlett Foundation. Tell us what people who see you tonight for the world premiere are going to experience and kind of the thought behind it. Um, well, first and foremost, I wanted to just say it's an absolute pleasure to go on after Larry. Um, I just had a remix going, like, where imagine if he was on the Supreme Court instead of running. Uh, so, uh, Larry, instead of Brett Kavanaugh, maybe, I don't know. But um, it's such a treat to walk into this amazing space and just be reminded uh, that the possibilities and potentialities of when people try to really change the course of history, um, small concentrated groups of people are where change occurs. Um, so 1969 uh, was when the first internet hub was made in California, um, and that was at UCLA between UCLA and Stanford Research Institute. So we got in touch with uh, those guys, we're working with Brewster, and we are doing a kind of a contemporary electronic music homage to the 50th anniversary of the internet tonight. Um, this is going to be, it's already sold out, so if you didn't get tickets, we can, you know, imagine it, maybe. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, the good news is that it's, it's kind of like uh, you realize, especially after Larry's coming on, weird stuff like Article 13 and the GDPR, or the crazy copyright stuff in the US, none of that would really be possible without a group of engineers and scientists and dedicated math geeks who made that possible back in 1969 and then expanded it to everyone else. So um, as a musician, composer, and artist, I also do the visuals uh, for part of the material. Um, I wanted to work with Internet Archive, go through the archive, and then derive a kind of a composite um, of all of these things that are going to a kind of a music piece. So um, the, uh, we are joined here with Greg, who's doing visuals, and Roger Antonsen, who's a mathematician, who's going to be doing a lot of data visualization of the world of large numbers for the piece. So Greg, can I just uh, ask you to speak a little as well? Yes, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, we're really thrilled about the show. We did a presentation this morning for the school kids of San Francisco, and they loved it. And uh, the first uh, section, there's three sections, the first section has um, an archival footage element and uh, will take us from 1969 to 2019, all with archive uh, uh, video from the Internet Archive, and it's uh, pretty dramatic. We did a lot in those 50 years, and we're trying to tie together the to social and the technical layers and how the two co-constructed each other. The second section is best introduced by the creator of it himself, Roger Antonsen. All right, so the second movement, um, there are tons of visualizations of networks because you can visualize them in various ways. So I play around with creating and destroying networks and it's all about patterns, it's all about see how things spread. It's all about also visualizing them in different kinds of ways to see different things. So there'll, there'll be me running on the computer, um, a live program made in processing in Java and uh, it'll, it'll visualize the music. And then the third section is called Elpis, right? You called it Elpis, not Elvis, but Elpis, which is Greek for hope. And uh, uh, that the, expresses the hope of finding our way through the complex world of networking. And it actually is performed by you, DJ Spooky, through a VR. So it's going to be a music and vis visual VR performance, and uh, it looks amazing. So I'm really lo looking forward to it. So I guess just by way of conclusion, um, working with Internet Archive has been an absolute pleasure and honor. And I can't believe 10, 20 years has gone by so quickly. Um, I remember we were here with um, Larry, uh, uh, someone from Brazil who became Minister of Culture, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Gilberto Gil. Uh, just someone, you know, kind of coming up from Brazil, right? Um, and given the right-wing populism that the world has experienced and with the lunatic Bolsonaro in uh, Brazil or various other stuff, um, these are moments where I think that the arts really can help us uh, re-inform and reintroduce and re-kind of contextualize the fact that there are so many potentials to move forward. Um, so imagine in Germany in the 1930s during the Weimar Republic right before a certain gentleman took over um, and you realize that the arts helped um, really create a different world for people. Um, I think we're in kind of a critical moment. 
Um, so this is where I think the web is going to be the forum for the 21st century as we move forward. Um, and the concert's being introduced by um, Dr. Leonard Kleinrock, who's generally considered to be the first person to ever send a message over the internet. Um, there's a wonderful movie Werner Herzog did with him uh, called Lo and Behold. And if you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. Um, so he's introducing the show tonight uh, from UCLA, and so we have a really fun show. And I think members of the Internet Archive are going to be hosting the after party. So we'll have the geek DJ scenario. Um, uh, so I guess just come and hang out. Yeah. Do not despair if you did not get your ticket. Last night we uploaded the raw files from Paul Miller into the Internet Archive. You can play with those. You can go see the amazing visuals, truly beautiful visuals, at the Catherine Clark Gallery by Roger Attenson and, and Greg Niemeyer. And there's going to be a video of tonight's performance also available for everyone in the Internet Archive. Thank you for the generosity of your spirit, for your creativity, and for coming on a very busy day oh, so to say just, hi. It, I believe it's, we're doing the whole thing under a Creative Commons license. You are. So we're having the San Francisco, I wanted to make sure to mention, San Francisco Girls Chorus is singing Binary Code. So if anyone wants to really <laughs> remix it, there we go. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so how many of you had a chance this morning to go to some of the 20 some odd demo stations today? Great, so if you did, you had a chance to taste the recipes of 1923, to see the films in the public domain, to get a tattoo of the public domain images, to see the remarkable output that has been unleashed from this new crop of treasures. So we decided that there's so much going on, there's so many amazing things to share, that we would do a few lightning round talks. It's going to be fast and furious, and in the next 50 minutes, we have five speakers who are going to take you through a little bit of what is happening. Everything from Cheyenne Holman, who was the former director of the Free Music Archive, who's going to talk to you about how music can come alive. Our own Rick Prelinger with his amazing films, not only public domain, but think from 1923, but those from before, also in the public domain. We have Hannah Donovan, who flew out here from New York on the eve of her new app, Trash.app, going live to show you how you can take public domain materials and make amazing movies out of it. And we have Ryan Merkley and Brewster Kale who are going to look at the future. What lies beyond this moment? What kind of sustainable structures do we need? What else is there that we can do? So, 10 minutes each, five speakers. Let's start with Cheyenne Holman, former director of the Free Music Archive. Thank you, everyone. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, so, has anybody heard of the Free Music Archive? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so a few of you do. Um, my name is Cheyenne Holman. I was the director of the Free Music Archive from 2014 until December 15th, 2018. So if you know any other Free Music Archives that are looking for directors, let me know. Uh, <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, so the Free Music Archive went online in 2009. And it is now home to more than 125,000 pieces of alternatively licensed audio, which took a long time to get to, but was really, really fun. Uh, it's primarily Creative Commons licensed, but there are public domain items in there as well. And I'm here to talk to you about 500 of them, uh, though we, um, or the archive, it is uh, constantly bringing in new material. And we have some, uh, sorry, some artists that are constantly bringing in CC0 direct modern music. In 2009, the Free Music Archive was founded by WFMU, which is a commercial, non-commercial, freeform radio station in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, it was developed and intended to be a space for people to come and find curated cu Creative Commons audio. Uh, there are lots and lots of places online now that you can find Creative Commons audio, but this was the only one that was directed with intention to bring venues, music festivals, net labels, actual record labels that create slabs of vinyl, and radio stations to bring recordings in. Uh, in 2018, at the end of the year, it was acquired by KitSplit, 
which is a platform for camera equipment sharing and the Free Music Archive, because it is full of music that can be used freely in video, is um, can now considered part of their suite of free creative tools for professional uh, videographers and people who create visual, audiovisual things. So, okay, so um, the Free Music Archive has 3,000 plus public domain tracks, as I said. About 2,500 of those tracks have come from artists or were, were in the public domain already. Uh, but I'm gonna talk to you about how the Free Music Archive was able to generate and contribute to and engage with the public domain. And this was through song challenges. This was community engagement at its very finest. The song challenges were super fun. You'll see up here a few that I'm not gonna get to because they didn't have anything to do with the public domain. But one that I wanna mention is the one with the turkey or chicken carcass there. <laughs> um, it was uh, called the Premix. And so this group, Vitamin Pets, released all the stems from their album before it was released and asked people to create their own versions of songs that hadn't been released yet. So it was a lot of fun. And some really, really wild avant-garde stuff came out of that. <laughs> The first thing I want to talk about is the Happy Birthday Song Contest. Some of you may have heard about this, and this actually wasn't something that generated material for the public domain, but it generated a lot of buzz and attention about the fact that Happy Birthday to You was not yet in the public domain. I think somebody's going to talk about that later today, so I'll leave it to them. Uh, though all of the songs that were submitted uh, were released under a Creative Commons attribution license, and more than 150 songs were sent into the archive. Some of them are laden with profanity and are not suitable for children's <laughs> birthday parties. <laughs> However, most of them are. And the ones that, uh, the titles will give you a hint about whether or not they are laden with profanity. Uh, okay, so onto the public domain stuff. In 2013, the Revitalized Music Competition was announced, and this was the first of its kind for the Free Music Archive. Um, we chose four compositions from the public domain, Beautiful Dreamer, God Be With You Until We Meet Again, The Spaniard That Blighted My Life, and NOLA. And 26 songs were composed, cover versions of these songs. And um, they were all released back into the public domain using the CC0 Universal License. Next was one of my favorites. It's called Masters Remastered. And it was um, intended to bring new life to classical pieces of music. So music that was definitely in the public domain, you've seen it in Looney Tunes and lots and lots of other productions. They're, you know, musical phrases that people know and love. Uh, some of them are now performed just on a computer keyboard that's been recorded, <laughs> wearing different kinds of gloves, because we can. Uh, we released all of these into the public domain as well, and there are 52 of them. The next one was also super fun. In 2015, we asked people to make what we called micro songs. Micro songs were 15 seconds or less, and these were intended to be used in uh, things like vines and Instagram videos, which at the time were quite short. Uh, everything in the collection is um, CC0, so no rights reserved, and the 350 songs listened to end to end, top out, at an hour and eight minutes. <laughs> so if you want a very frenetic and interesting listening experience, that's one to check out. Um, in 2015, we also did third and final one of the series, um, a project called Unreal Trailers. And the name Unreal, we know, is spelled <laughs> incorrectly. Um, but it is correct, because we asked people to recut public domain footage that they found online. And Rick's going to talk about some of that footage in just a moment. Um, to make a movie trailer for a film that didn't exist. So recut a movie to make you know, a, an instructional film about how to take care of your boat into a horror film. And use uh, music from the Free Music Archive to soundtrack it. This was a lot of work, admittedly, so we only got 14 trailers out of it, but they were really, really interesting, and there's a gallery of them on the Free Music Archive website. In 2017, I'm sure all of you know, the net neutrality battle was really coming to a boil, and so I took an interview that I had done about net neutrality and its importance with Michael Weinberg, friend of the FMA, uh, and cut up, I think, 25 samples 
Some of them were like funny quotes that he said, things that could be easily taken out of context in a humorous way, but also educational quotes about the meaning of net neutrality and why it's important. Um, these samples were all released under public domain, and eight people we uh, connected with CC Mixter, which is a Creative Commons remix community, and eight remixes were made in the extremely short <laughs> uh, like week and a half I gave people to do this so we could raise awareness about um, some legislation that needed lots of signatures. And three of them remained in the public domain, which I thought was really generous of those artists because they put a lot of work into those. Last but not least was 2017's audio cookbook. This was interesting because it was not so much taking things from the public domain, though I did link to some really kooky old um, cookbooks so people could get some inspiration. Uh, but it, I was asking people to take recipes and put them to music. And that's because recipes are not covered by copyright. So we got 11 songs out of it, some about beverages, one about pizza, a couple about pie, one about a donut. Uh, and um, the winner was about sun tea, <laughs> how to make sun tea, which isn't much of a recipe, but it was a good song. Um, and that was also donated to the public domain. Um, and so that's about 500 songs that during a time when nothing was coming into the public domain regularly, we were able to engage people and add about 500 audio tracks to the public domain, free for anyone to use. And, you know, they're all still there. <laughs> so if you want to check them out, please go to freemusicarchive.org. And I'd like to thank you for your time. So, hi everybody. Do I click? I click. Um, so my entire career has been made possible by the public domain. When I started uh, collecting films in the 1980s, I had no idea why I was doing it. I was a sleepwalker. But as films started to pile up around my platform bed and then filled my little office in Chinatown and then four rooms in the meatpacking district, I learned about copyright. And much more thrillingly, the absence of copyright. This was the first film I collected. Not this one. Traffic safety must be taught by word and action to our children as soon as they are able to walk. Many municipalities in conjunction with schools are doing excellent work along these lines. That's Oakland in 1948. I learned about boundlessly rich areas, a film that were no longer in copyright due to the strange and complex characteristics of the law. From friends, I learned that commercial media companies would pay for access to public domain films. So I went into the stock footage business that brought in money so I could collect more. We gave footage to artists and community makers for free, but I couldn't afford to give it away to everybody, even though I wanted to. These boys greet their dad as though they are genuinely glad to see him, as though they had really missed being away from him during the day and are anxious to talk to him. This is the time for pleasant discussion in a thoroughly relaxed mood. They don't pick this time of the day to spring unpleasant surprises on dad. If they have disagreeable news, they'll postpone the discussion until another time. And this is no time to dun father for a raise in your allowance, new clothes, or argue about other financial matters. And then I met Brewster Kale. 30 seconds into our first conversation, he asked me, why don't you put your archives online for free? I didn't get this at first, but I soon realized he was right, and we put 1,001 films online, public access to the public domain through the Internet Archive, and it cost us nothing. We kept on selling access to materials because some companies always need paperwork, and guess what? We made more money. Columbia University scientists play with their new atom smasher at Irvington on Hudson, New York. They have an unscientific high time with the new $2 million cyclotron, 
the most powerful magnet in the world. Unable to show the cyclotron at work on atoms, they use these metal rods to demonstrate the action of the magnet. The metal objects tend to line themselves up parallel with the direction of the field, in the same manner that a magnetic compass needle parallels the Earth's magnetic field and points to the North Pole. A seemingly supernatural stunt illustrates the great magnetic pull, which will separate potent protons from the atom. Even three men have a hard time pulling a chain from the heart of the great cyclotron. It's quite an experience for usually blasé newsreel cameramen and source of new occupational hazards. This cameraman will have to learn a little more about coping with the new atomic age. Let's strive for the highest use of our technology. We've now put 7,000 films online, many of them under the CC public domain dedication. More people in more places use our footage for more projects. I'll never know how many. But this is the highest destiny of an archives, to propagate its holdings throughout the world so that they become ubiquitous every day. And thanks to the public domain, I've therefore led a privileged life. The house on the left smolders for a few moments. Looks almost as if it will not burn, and then bursts into flame. The house on the right continues to burn. Two houses are a total loss, but the well-kept and painted house in the middle still stands. Which of these is your house? <laughs> this one? The house on the right, dilapidated with paper, dead grass, litter everywhere. The house on the left, Unpainted, run down, neglected. Is this your house? The house in the middle, cleaned up, painted up and fixed up, exposed to the same searing atomic heat wave, did not catch fire. Public access to the public domain, such an important idea. That's one of the things we're here to celebrate, but something we need to work a lot harder on making happen. As part of his everyday regime, Michael Shaw enters this home health center. He lies for perhaps 15 seconds on a kind of medical couch. His weight, temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, and electrocardiogram are routinely recorded. At the same time, his body is scanned for any isolated temperature pockets that signal oncoming disease or a localized infection. At the end of the examination period, the computer calculates the amount of exercise necessary to balance Mike's food intake and maintain proper muscle tone. Exercise requirements. Eight and one half minutes bicycle. Six minutes programmed calisthenics. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, this thing can make a mistake, you know. I think the unstalling of the public domain that we're celebrating today is a catalytic event that I hope will propagate the idea of public access to the public domain to even more people. But now I'm going to end with a celebratory clip that I hope you'll also take as a kind of warning. Developed because of this nation's imperishable heritage of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is this that has given us all of the industrial progress that we have achieved in the past and a certainty of progress in the future. A certainty as long as this great gift of liberty, individual liberty to grow greater and better, is valued and protected. You are descendants of pioneers. But you are also pioneers. Opportunities still rise from every smokestack, every test tube, every laboratory, every workshop in the land. You have come a long way from the drudgery of the blacksmith shop and the hand labor of that day. But your journey forward has just started because this is America. Where do we go from here? Straight ahead and don't spare the horses. Horses, your grandfather. There aren't any more horses. My grandfather. I wonder what our grandparents would say if they could see the world as it is now. Great work, kids. Carry on. Carry on what? The heritage they handed us. Freedom. Individual initiative. Opportunity. Let's go, America!
let's use the great distribution system that originates in places like here, the Internet Archive, to push public domain works out to everyone, especially people who don't know they need them until they've seen them. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I am Hannah Donovan, and I am the founder and CEO of a new video company called Trash. We are a creative tool, and we do predictive editing for video using AI, which means that you shoot or collect video, and we do the editing. I'm going to give you a demo of how it works in just a minute. But before I get there, I want to build on something that we heard about earlier today, which is the importance of video remix, because we are so excited to be here today working with the Internet Archive to make it easy for folks like you to take video footage from the public domain and play with it and edit it on your phone with one tap. So like many of you here, I grew up in a remix-first world, and video culture looks a little bit something like this. I didn't come here to make friends. I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to make friends. I'm not here to make friends. I ain't here to make no friends. You used to call me on my cell phone late night when you need my love. Call me on my cell phone late night when you need my love. I'm horned out half. Horned out five. Horned out five. Horned out five. Horned out five. Quart, 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 quarter. Horned out five. I did the moon, but the morning I was in the middle of the half. I'm horned out half, but the morning I was quarter half. I'm horned out five. 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 This is America. So, those are some of the favorite video remixes and mashups from my team back in New York. And as you can see, this stuff is super fun. This is the video culture that's around us. But there's a problem, which is that a lot of this stuff is actually kind of very difficult to make because creators kind of have to download it, do it on desktop, re-upload it again, takes, gets taken down. And it's also not often sanctioned by these consumer platforms that we use for video, especially when it comes to attribution, which is really important for creators. And so this is what we're building with Trash, a remix-first video editing app because one person's trash is another person's treasure when it comes to remixing video. So I want to start by asking, with a quick show of hands, who here in this room today has ever tried editing video? Put your hand up. That's a lot of you. OK, cool. Now keep your hand up. Wait, 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 don't go away. Keep your hand up if it was hard. Yep, yeah, yeah, the art of video editing is really difficult. Now keep your hand up if you'd wish that you'd shot more or different footage when you got to the editing stage. Exactly. So you can put your hands down. Thank you for that. Um, we're all awake now, right, just after lunch. Um, so this is, these are the two problems that we're solving with Trash. One, let's make it really easy for you to edit videos and do fun stuff like that. And number two, let's also make sure that you have what it's called coverage in video editing terms. Coverage just means having lots of stuff to play with. It's often the inspiration for documentary filmmaking, for montage, definitely for video memes. I mean, hell, it's what means, you know, like taking an auctioneer and putting it with like a hip hop concert makes it funny. That's coverage. This is what we're doing with Trash. So now I'm going to give you a quick demo on how this works. Um, so. All right, uh, here is some video that I shot at a, con at a concert uh, at a show in New York a couple of months ago. And as you can see here, you know, this is like a clip, you know, I probably wouldn't just put that clip on the internet, but if I can take a few different clips here, this is inside the Trash app. 
and throw them together, what's going to happen is when I press that button up there in the top right, Trash is going to take these clips of video from this show and it's going to try and edit them together for me right off the bat and make what we call in video terms a rough cut so that then I can go in and like do the fun stuff and tweak it and like maybe change the soundtrack and like the filter as people call it, you know, that kind of thing. When they, the LUT, you know, um, for those in the audience. And so let's uh, go ahead and hit that button and see what it makes with this footage from that show, okay? So not bad, right? It took all that footage, it edited it together, put a nice soundtrack on it, and already we have something with one tap that is like a lot better than usually what it would take me to do in like 20 minutes on my computer. But I think we could make this video cooler, actually. So what I'm gonna do now is let's imagine that I went to the Internet Archives account on Trash and I grabbed some of the public domain video there. And this time what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sample that and mix it into this video. So I'm gonna throw all that footage together, hit that button again, and let's see what it makes this time. You know, who doesn't love those high-waisted pants with a good techno beat, right? <laughs> so this is what we're doing. It's all fun. Um, Trash is going to be rolling out in beta over the coming months. So if you want to play with it, sign up for early access at our website, which is trash.app. And we will make sure that you get a beta invite. Um, it's free. It's really fun to use. And most importantly, it gives you very easy editing tools for all of this incredible public domain footage. Thank you so much. I got the arrows, it's okay. Good afternoon. We're at the low point where half of you are thinking very seriously about a nap. I'm gonna do my best to help you with that. Um, I actually gave a keynote once where someone fell asleep in the front row. It was, it was very disconcerting. It felt bad. Um, this won't happen this time. So I've worked in the Commons for um, a little over 15 years. Um, I, was, uh, I established City of Toronto's Open Data Project. Uh, I was Chief Operating Officer at Mozilla, and for the last five years, I've been running Creative Commons as the CEO. And my flagship project uh, at Creative Commons has been CC Search, a front door to the Commons that indexes, ultimately, um, the entire collection of the commons, uh, 1.4 billion works across over 9 million different websites with a catalog and an API that everyone can access. Now CC Search today, and you can catch a demo of it over there, um, now indexes over 268 million works across 21 different collections with a goal of doubling that in the next year. So that catalog includes over 30,000 images from the Cleveland Museum of Art, uh, which were shared online just two days ago. Yes as part of their new open access initiative, uh, and we're very proud to help them do that work. Now, my slides today are gonna feature only images from their collection. All the images you'll see are from the CMA collection. Uh, and I wanna recognize Jane Alexander and Ethan Holda from the CMA who are down front here, uh, and also Neil Stimler who consulted with them. Now, I want to single them out for a couple of reasons. First, because what they've done is wonderful, and it is a gift to humanity, and it was an enormous, enormous amount of work. And I want to make an example of them, because what they did was a massive legal, programmatic, and technical undertaking that marshaled the resources of the entire organization, along with those of many other organizations. And to be honest, this work doesn't nearly get enough support, not inside organizations, not in the public, uh, and the support that it desperately needs. As a result, no surprise, the digital public domain is much smaller than it should be, and it is perpetually at risk. So this is what I want to talk to you about today. 
Now, collaboration lights me up. I love the things that people can only do together. I'm really interested in those things. And too much of our focus is only on individual achievement and not nearly enough about how we build collective power and exert it together. Now, collect, um, sorry, there's really, for me, no more valuable fuel for that than the commons and the public domain. By the way, next week, Eric Stoyer and I, who's also here, are launching a new podcast called Plays Well with Others uh, that is all about the art and science and mechanics of collaboration. So keep an eye out for that guy. Now, we're celebrating the public domain today, and we should. But we also face this growing challenge. We suffer from an overwhelming lack of sustainability in what maintains uh, these materials and access for the works in the digital public domain. And I'd say there's five interconnected factors, probably more, as to why this is the case. Um, but first of all, the challenges of navigating these ever-expanding rules of copyright and its various international terms and conventions. Now, this causes institutions and especially their lawyers and their counsel to insist that they remain locked up longer than needs be. The absence of a trusted database of all copyrighted works and related data, especially those works that are in the commons. The cost of preservation, of restoration, of digitization, of storage, of bandwidth, and software needed to enable access to those works, which is, compared to the potential need, massively underfunded. And a lack of standards for sharing and accessing those works, which constrains their use and innovation, and frustrates those who make the investment, because only to see their collections isolated or underused, never completely reaching their potential. And lastly, and I think really importantly, this absence of sustainable business models or just models to support the development and maintenance of these collections online, including redundancies of these collections to support a more resilient and performant commons. Now the digital commons that we already have is also at risk. As the business models that have supported content creation on the web are breaking, even today we're watching news coming out of BuzzFeed with entire news divisions being laid off uh, and really talented creators losing their jobs. The commons is at risk of being caught up in this collapse. Today's debates about the future sustainability of journalism, of music, of academic publishing, of data sharing, UGC platforms, and photography omit the fact that much of the commons has rode along with those business models, and we have been the beneficiaries. We are dependent on this goodwill of those platforms and the commercial viability of those companies, whether they rise or fall. According to our most recent State of the Commons report, over one-third of the content in the Commons is hosted on for-profit platforms. Now, for consumers, we're seeing this rejection of advertising and surveillance capitalism and of artificial scarcity created by paywalls and DRM. This is a good thing. I'm super happy to see the end of those things. And they are, but they are also, and we have to acknowledge, the business models that have sustained huge portions of the Commons. When they go, what is going to replace them? And where are we in that discussion? In the boardrooms where new models are being conceived, there is little or no discussion of how to replace them with new ethical models that benefit the commons. And how much better would be if those new business models had the commons at the center of their business model, not as an add-on or a nice to have. Now somewhere in this audience, you're gonna find Ben McCaskill. He and his brother Don are the new owners of Flickr. Now of those 1.4 billion CC licensed works, about 450 million of them are on their platform. You likely know that they're moving to a new, slightly higher priced, paid model in order to make the business sustainable. And you likely also know that they have announced that they'll protect the CC licensed works they've been hosting and serving for all these years. Yes, thank you. Now, Ben and his team have decided not to sell your data or to pursue advertising models in order to make their business, new business, sustainable, which I think is commendable. But they have also had to make a mostly free service less free in order to do it. And that's had challenges and it's upset people. That's a tough problem and one we should want to help them work through because we rely on some of those platforms. Now the content ecosystem is struggling. Many sites have struggled financially. They've been sold, resold like Flickr. When others have dropped open licensing altogether, we've been bought by other companies. We're seeing a reduction of public and philanthropic funding to support this work, not an increase. Wikipedia is now putting pressure on big players like Google to fund them for using their works. There's a lot of discussion about this future of content creation, but very little of it is focused on our shared resources. 
And sectors like open education and academic publishing, which have been talking about new models for years, have yet to find the one that works. Sorry, I don't know how to solve this problem yet. And if you were hoping for that in the last 30 seconds of my talk, you're going to be disappointed. But it's why I'm here talking about it in front of all of you, because I said at the beginning, I think that some of the smartest, most dedicated, committed people to the open web are in this room right here, and I want to start this conversation with all of you. Solving this is central to the vision that I want to bring to Creative Commons, but CC tools are just one part of how we solve this problem, and I'm under no illusions that we don't have to do more in order to get where we need to go. And we're going to need to look beyond the traditional sectors that we've worked with in order to solve these problems. I especially want to think about how we engage, engage people who are creators and in the creative space to join those boardroom conversations and ask us and them, what do they have to win for us to win, and how can we work together? I really believe that if we collaborate, we can do great things together. And I look forward to those discussions, and I really welcome the opportunity to talk to you about them. Thank you. Well, the Internet Archive does have a business model supporting the commons, and we're actually doing quite well, uh, which I'm uh, really quite uh, happy about. Um, the Internet Archive has been doing better each year, and it's been shifting more towards getting monies from uh, end users um, that have been using the Internet Archive, not just institutional partners, which have been fabulous uh, to work with, and foundations, but we've been getting more and more, and we had almost 100,000 people contribute last year. But we're a small uh, organization, but hopefully an example that you can make uh, an organization work, long-term permanence work, um, and be free and open and accessible and not spy on your users. So, hooray. Uh, this is a good news to bad news, but we're gonna go out singing into break um, about there has been some progress uh, in access from libraries. Um, and I, I just think we should just take, you know, I, I'm pretty good at complaining or reading the news and thinking everything's going to hell. Um, but actually, there's some things that are going good. Like, 1923 is now in the public domain. You can use it, reuse it forever for free without worrying about lawyers. Hooray! <laughs> and I would like to tip my hat. Actually, I get to literally to Larry Lessig. Because I think actually the major reason why 1923 has not been extended beyond is the noise and aggregation and the movement that he and others, but he really started. Thank you very much, Larry Russell. <laughs> but the public domain, you'd think it would be publicly accessible. But actually, it's kind of like a park with a a lot of fences around it, with guns pointing out, trying to keep you away from it. That a lot of the public domain is not publicly accessible, which I think is really a shame. Um, and organizations that know better, um, there's a large search engine down south, um, that has a lot of public domain materials that are in fact still locked up, that we should go, and it's a pretty small little world, let's at least let people have access to it. But we went back through and found the, uh, the 1923 works in the Internet Archive, the books, music, and uh, there are 20,000 of them, and we've remarked them all public domain from 600 different contributors. Hooray! There was this weird little piece of the, of the uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act um, that said, okay, libraries can go and make things available for the last 20 years that they ex retroactively extended as long as it's not uh, commercially exploited. Okay, I'm not a lawyer, don't hold me to this, but anyway, that's what I kind of understand out of the whole thing. It turns out to be really tricky to figure out if something is commercially available or not. You'd think that would be easy. You'd just go and ask the, um, the uh, Amazon API until they shut you down, right? Until you try to go in and get access to some of these things to be able to figure it out. But on the other hand, we have 20,000 candidates, and we've been working at it for quite a while. And there's going to be a long blog post about how awful it is to try to march mark records against Amazon records. But we've got 700 uh, works up uh, that are up to 1943 that are now what are called library public domain, free to have access. So we're 
So we're going there, guys, uh, up through 1943. And those that are around big institutions, let's not draw the line at 1923. Let's draw the line at least at 1943. Uh, for those, those risk-averse players, and let's get those up. We'll go through your catalog. We'll go and find out what is library public domain, and we'll help digitize it and make it permanently available for everybody. I think that's something we should go off and do. But here is even something better. Okay. <laughs> I, up until January 1st, I was unaware of anything and during my professional career of anything in the United States going into the public domain because of expiration. In my whole career, it would just seem like it was just a plight of people being idiots on parade um, towards going and being anti basically a generation that learns from their screens. But now we're seeing that. But I really didn't think I'd see positive legislation that actually made things more available, right? I mean, could you imagine, right? The courts were doing okay, but the legislature, and then there was the museum, uh, the Music Modernization Act. The, museum, uh, the, the Mo Music Modernization Act was a, a bill that was written by the RIAA and put into the uh, um, House of Representatives, and it passed unanimously, and it was dreadful. This was um, basically a wish list from streaming companies and uh, dealing with the pre-1972 copyright things. And there's enough geeks in this audience that uh, really understand sort of all this. But that stuff was sort of all torn up under uh, state uh, law. It was really complicated what to do with pre-1972 sound recordings. Should they be federalized, how they should be federalized. And basically what the law um, was putting put in place um, that would have happened unanimous uh, from the uh, is this record, actually, and this cylinder uh, record from the Edison Amaral record. Um, you can tell it's from Edison because it's got his face on it. We're really going to talk about Edison over and over again because uh, he puts his face on everything. Anyway, this would not have gone into the public domain until 2067. I mean, what? Um, and uh, so, um, so this was going through, um, and you know, the House, House representative said, oh, this is awesome. And, uh, and then it came to the Senate. And there were a bunch of us that just went, help! And you know what? We got somebody to help. It was one person, Ron Wyden. Uh, and Ron Wyden said, hey, wait a minute. There isn't any trade-off here for the public sphere at all in this law. And there was this back and forth. And we just wanted the thing dead. Um, and the Internet Archive went to bat. Uh, public knowledge went to bat, EFF, uh, the library associations went to bat, and we said, no, come on, there's got to be a trade-off. If you're going to go and do more of a giveaway for more rights holders and more uh, uh, music labels, you've got to give something up. And they did. It's, it's, it's okay, it's, it's, really, it's quirky and cool. Um, there's two provisions, it's kind of complicated. Okay, but I'm going to talk about the piece that, that, that applies to libraries. Libraries are allowed to take pre-1972 sound recordings that are out of the public domain, uh, that are not commercially available, whatever that means, not commercially available. Libraries can go and take pre-1972 and make it freely available for download and listening, library public domain. Woohoo! Pre-1972, that's pretty recent, right? And so we went through um, our bus, a bunch of our test records, our LPs that we'd been digitized, digitized about 10 years ago. We're about to gear it all back up again. Uh, and we found 745 LPs that are awesome uh, LPs in the unlocked collection. And so we're at least, uh, there's a positive uh, movement in this particular area. Another uh, fun thing is we've now gotten really good at storing things and backing things up. When Flickr started to sh uh, shake and wobble like Vine did or Tumblr or uh, Yahoo videos or Google videos, there used to be Google videos, six million videos, they were awesome, but they're gone. Um, there's um, uh, MobileMe from Apple. You know, these were very rich companies, but they just shut the end down these services. Um, when that started to wobble, uh, we, we wanted to go and provide a permanent home. I'm very, very happy to learn. I got to meet uh, one of the uh, leaders of the new Flickr owner, Smug Mug, who's here. You here? Here, there, yay. Um, that they're, 
um, trying to find a business model and working on it and committing to try to, uh, uh, so they're not immediately deleting, like we see these notices, in seven days, we're going to take all this down. Um, uh, the the Flickr um, create Commons and also those people that uploaded things and dedicated things to the Creative Commons. But we've now been backing things up, and I understand we've got 200 million images, um, which is 450 terabytes uh, um, that are blinking in the back uh, there, those blinking lights. Some of those are Flickr images going out to the world, um, as well as on the rest of the servers uh, of the Internet Archive. So. That's also good towards going and putting reinforcing structure underneath companies that come and go to go and make it so that if you're dedicating to the commons, it works forever. But what we really like is the URLs to continue working. We've got a real problem that basically when people think take things off the web, the URLs go dead. And uh, it could be solved in a number of different ways. One would be the browser companies could go and make it so that if, it's not, if you get a 404 document not found, it tries the Wayback Machine. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so, uh, but they haven't done it. Um, we've been working with these guys, and we just need more pressure to go and say things that used to be on the web are useful too. Um, so we need a little bit more pressure in making all uh, of that work. Another positive is the blind and dyslexic. We can digitize things and make things broadly available to the blind and dyslexic, low vision uh, people. And we've gone and digitized over a million books and made them uh, available um, to people, which I think is pretty great. And I can't stop patting myself on the back of that, but I've been a freaking loser. Because for most of the time that we've been saying this, it's been accessible to very, very few people. It's, be, it's very few people because we were scared. And we wanted to make this available to people um, that had somebody go and sign up and say that they are blind and dyslexic enough. And we basically figured out how to use the Library of Congress's keys uh, to go and decrypt our books in the same way that would decrypt their books. So if you're um, uh, low vision enough for the Library of Congress, you were uh, low enough vision uh, for us, go for it. It was a very safe thing, and you know what? I'm not sure anybody figured out how to use it. It was not good enough. So we took another step. Um, we went and we anointed and uh, lots of different organizations, and I'm looking for many, many, many more that have organizations that go and work with people with disabilities and allow them to go and take the accounts and say, you, 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 you are anointed by us, therefore you have access to this, and it's all free. And so we now have um, a lot more organizations that have been joining in uh, to make this available. So that's good. Okay, but it's still not good enough. When we look at the number of people that have been signed up by these other organizations, it's very small. So we haven't cracked the nut uh, yet. Um, there's another positive thing in this area, and it's the Marrakesh Treaty. So the Marrakesh Treaty is a, um, uh, a treaty to try to make it so that uh, it's actually explicitly legal to digitize books in a country and share them with the other print disability organizations around uh, the world. And at this point, um, all of the blues and reds have had either the treaty signed or ratified in them. Um, so the treaty is going uh, further and farther. We've always allowed it worldwide, um, and now with this anointing thing, um, but hopefully other organizations uh, will uh, go, go forward further. So that's also good news, right? So it's like, okay, there's been some good news. All right, now this is the, this is the downer part. This is the downer part. Um, these are the books that are in the Library of Cong uh, the Internet Archives collections now. And, and you can see, uh, and it's been by decade. So decade, decade, decade. And up through 1923, we're actually doing pretty well. Libraries participated. They paid the 10 cents a page to go and digitize a lot and make it publicly available. It's just pretty freaking awesome. It's great. Um, 
But then, in 1923, it craters. People were worried, and they didn't give them to us. So we've been starting to collect books that had been donated, and we've been digitizing 1,000 books every day, which is great. Um, but it, there's still a whole lot uh, more to go. We basically have a century that is being denied of digital learners. We have a century missing from the libraries of people today. We have the last time that fascism rose around the world went up, and there was a lot of lessons learned, and you can't see them if you're a digital learner. And you know what? We're all digital learners. So this gap, I find really compelling to try uh, to level out. What we need is all of those, that in line to just continue going up after 1923. You say, oh, well, if you can't get it online, then maybe you can just go buy the book or something like that. Of course, all these authors are all uh, in print and, and, and going nuts, right? Um, if you look at Amazon's um, uh, books by decade in their warehouses, um, that it goes up to 1923 and craters again just the same way. That basically there's a lost century, not only digitally, but physically to a generation that really wants to have access to it. So we thought, why don't we try to solve that by doing something along the lines of digitizing and lending, doing what libraries do. Can we go and make it so that these books would still be somewhat available to people um, so for previewing or, or, or for borrowing? And so we came out with this thing in 2011, and we digitized books that are in uh, modern books, and we made them available one copy at a time, one reader at a time. Okay, it's kind of lame, but it worked. And we've been doing it since 2011, and we thought lots of libraries would come and join on. You know what? They didn't. Um, so uh, we thought we'd uh, try to get uh, more uh, help there, and we said, what was the problem? They said, legal fears. And one of my heroes, Pam Samuelson, pulled together a lot of our copyright scholars to come up with controlled digital lending, a uh, position paper to go and ar argue within the United States that it is legal under fair use and other things that I don't incredibly understand, um, to be able to go and digitize and lend books as long as there's no more copies in circulation. So, um, and now there are a number of libraries, but too, still too few uh, that are, are joining in to, to make uh, this explicit and um, make it so that they start lending copies from their libraries as well. It works really well for the long tail, the 20th century materials. It doesn't really work for the Harry Potters uh, and, and the like. So what we, what we want is a Wikipedia where there's a little read now button next to every uh, footnote in Wikipedia. Would you like that? <laughs> so, we want to turn every link blue. We want to go and make it so that you can take a Wikipedia article and find out more about it. We want you to be able to look at it, want more, dig in and go. And there's been a success. Um, we basically went and wrote a robot, actually other volunteers did, and we helped them out, the right robots to go and fix the links in Wikipedia, and they fixed 10 million links. It is, the, it is the number one most popular thing that people go to from Wikipedia, and the next thing they want to go to is books, and the next thing is journal literature. So what do you think the next uh, two things on the agenda? Books, then journal literature. So this is our approach on books, is to try to make it so it read now, and when you click on that, it opens right to the right page. If you flip to, if you, if, if you flip one back or two forward, things like that, then it pushes you into a borrow situation. But at least you can get something beyond the uh, encyclopedia, which is uh, when I was growing up, you'd get an F if you just cited the encyclopedia. So let's give people some, some more uh, to work with. So control digital lending. We now have a 1.5 million book wish list. This is what's um, popular on Wikipedia, what's popular out of syllabi, and what's popular in, and widely held in libraries. 1.5 million, it's about a $30 million project, and we're on a roll and a rip, and we need your help. So we're, we're going to go and turn all those darn links blue. So I promise you that I'm going to go out with a song, and we're going to go out with a song. Uh, uh, it was the hit, and you're going to hopefully uh, recognize it by the time it comes around to the, uh, uh, to the chorus, and you're going to have to demand to sing it. It's called Yes, We Have No Bananas. <laughs> Street, 
It's run by a freak, and he keeps good things to eat, but you should hear him speak. When you ask him anything, he never answers no. He just guesses you to death, and as he takes your dough, he tells you yes. We have a dough no banana. bananas. We, we have, have no bananas, bananas today. today. With string beans and onions, cabbages and scallions, and all kinds of fruit and say. Thank you very much. Oh, Brewster, this, this outfit becomes you, I think. Yes, we have no bananas in the public domain. Everyone, we're in a break. Come back at 3.50. You're going to want to be here for Cory Doctorow, Pam Samuelson, and more. Go get a granola bar, stretch, and we'll see you here live stream, folks, back at 3.50. Thank you.
Okay, folks, time to find your seat. We have the one and only Cory Doctorow, Pam Samuels, and so many creators, and a party afterwards where you can learn to Charleston. There will be 78s playing, there will be silent films, there will be great Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, which were started in 1923. So please, let's get going, and welcome back to our live stream buddies, hashtag public domain day, if you want to send us out a shout out. It is great to see you all back here in the great room of the Internet Archive in San Francisco. I'm Wendy Hanamura, Director of Partnerships, and pleased to be your host for this evening. We are here to talk about magic, because there are so many magical things that can be done with these new materials. One of the great things about public domain is they can be translated. They can be translated into other languages, they can be read into audiobooks, they can be put into braille, they can reach much, much more diverse audiences. And that is some of what we're gonna hear in our next set of Lightning Talk speakers. We have five speakers for the next 50 minutes. Everyone from Ben Verschbau, who comes to us from Wikimedia Foundation, talking about how Wikipedians incorporate public domain materials into these articles. We have Amy Mason from the Lighthouse for the Blind and the Visually Impaired. She's gonna talk about what happens when you unlock these materials. Paul Keller, he's one of the four founders of this movement, ready to relaunch a manifesto for the public domain. Jane Park, who's been building great new tech so that you can find these things online. And finally, artist in residence for the Internet Archive, Paul Solalis, who has been working to create a beautiful new zine of 1923 materials, not only things that we already had, but voices that had disappeared, that had been erased from our history. So without further ado, it is my deep pleasure to introduce my friend, my colleague, a man of the book, Ben Verschbau of the Wikimedia Foundation. It made me feel like a rabbi or something. Um, <laughs> thank you, Wendy. Um, so where am I here? Okay, there we go. Let's do this. So hi, my name is Ben Verschbau. I'm here from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you don't know us, we are the nonprofit that supports Wikipedia, you may have heard of it, and a host of other open knowledge projects such as Wikimedia Commons, Wikisource, Wikidata, and of course, a global movement of volunteers and affiliate organizations who develop these projects. And uh, I direct a team called Community Programs at the Foundation, and it's a set of teams actually devoted to supporting our collaboration with knowledge allies, such as libraries, museums, archives, educational institutions, governments, research organizations, and also amazing organizations building access like the Internet Archive. So it's great to be here with you celebrating this grand reopening of the public domain in the US. And I do think it's important to give that geographical emphasis, because as we all know, there is no singular, seamless, and wholly global public domain. Maybe in our imaginations and our ideals, but definitely not in practice. Uh, but to rewind slightly, uh, about three years ago this month, I was celebrating uh, the proudest achievement of my previous job as director of NYPL Labs at the New York Public Library. On January 6th, 2016, we changed our access policies and released nearly 200,000 items, uh, totaling more than half a million high-resolution files from our digital collections for free and unfettered reuse. Thank you. It was definitely a group effort. Um, and we didn't just change policies, we refreshed our digital collection site, we created demo digital humanities projects and visualizations around highlight collections, we established a creative residency program, uh, made API enhancements, set up a GitHub repo with various data sets and utilities for exploring the collection in bulk. Um, and the public response was huge and ecstatic, and Cory Doctorow, who we'll be hearing from later, had a really nice tweet that summed up our feeling what we'd accomplished, which was nice. Uh, but perhaps he was a bit too generous uh, in his praise, because I think we got it almost right. While all tangible barriers to our public domain collections were effectively removed, and while we did uh, talk about the overall release in terms of the public domain, when it came down to labeling individual items, our rights team insisted we make a hedge. Uh, they understood that, globally speaking, there are many public domains. 
or rather many jurisdictional definitions of the public domain. Many of the items in our vast heterogeneous collections at MIPL were published outside of the US or created recently enough to make our universal claim risky, or make a universal claim risky. This also meant our administration was not comfortable applying a Creative Commons public domain mark or CC0 license as subsequent open access releases, like the Met Museum here in the States, or just a couple days ago, the Great Cleveland Museum of Art, another <laughs> round of applause, uh, have demonstrated as a best practice. So in the end, we did a lot of good. We helped expand the commons. We facilitated new creative works, uh, attracted new collection acquisitions to NYPL, I might add, and inspired other institutions to follow suit. But a feeling of incompleteness lingered. So this experience has stayed front of mind for me as more recently I've begun to grapple with the complexity of how the public domain functions in the highly international context of Wikimedia. The public domain is a fundamental tool for contextualizing the knowledge curated in Wikimedia projects. Though Wikipedia is published under a Creative Commons license, our communities often first look to illustrate articles with public domain material uploaded to Wikimedia Commons to ensure that further dissemination and reuse is free from legal restriction. Here's just a taste of some of the newly public domain artwork, mainly European, uh, being added to Commons in the past weeks since we ticked over to 2019. Illustration of Wikipedia over the years has, for example, leaned heavily on the public domain designation clearly articulated by the US government around its publications, using them to illustrate everything from American military history or the space program uh, to global figures photographed by the US State Department, such as the activist Nadia Sharmin from Bangladesh. But this gets much more complicated when trying to represent knowledge in other parts of the world. For example, our communities in India, and here are some members of our Punjabi community, are constantly working to better represent their culture and language on the web. Increasingly, they're having to figure out how to digitize materials in local libraries to serve as sources for growing new Wikipedias. To do this, they must assess both whether the work is available to them in the Indian public domain, as well as something that they can disseminate globally on our US-based servers. This has required an increasing and typically self-taught amount of complex knowledge about the public domain far beyond what should be expected of an everyday contributor to our projects. If we truly want to share and connect the sum of all knowledge, we need to simplify the complex process of establishing whether a work is in the public domain to begin with. This need has led to several projects operated by open activists uh, affiliated with the Wikimedia movement. For example, in Latin America, in both Argentina and Uruguay, and as recently uh, El Salvador, community-built author databases like these Autores websites have become powerful tools for navigating the question of which works are in the public domain in contexts where national libraries or other registries do not provide such information. With these tools, they can increasingly digitize and share, share with confidence materials unencumbered by copyright. But it's important to recognize this comes with significant community and technical overhead. We're also just beginning to see Wikidata and uh, uh, Wikimedia's open structured knowledge base as a service infrastructure for navigating the international public domain. An organization in the Netherlands called CopyClear is offering institutions automated copyright clearance for Dutch and European authors by analyzing data from multiple sources that's been aggregated in Wiki Wikidata. And we're also just beginning to see in Wikidata, and I wanna add this is very, very, very early community work, so it's not yet gelled into a consistent practice, but it's being used to model the legal requirements for the public domain across national jurisdictions. So for example, this is the barely six weeks old copyright status property, how it looks when applied to a specific artwork in Wikidata. And this one shows rationales for more than one jurisdiction, both the US and for any countries where PD status is assigned to artists who died 100 years ago or less. This one is really astonishing. Here you can start to see how contradictory copyright claims can be modeled in a machine-readable way. This Wikidata item describes the first published edition of the Diary of Anne Frank, 1947, the copyright status of which is disputed by the Anne Frank Fund. While Frank died in 1945, the fund claims a longer copyright term because her father, Otto Frank, edited the diary for publication purposes. So Wikidata is now being used to model this dispute accurately to guide appropriate use of the material. This is exciting, and again, very, very early stage work. If you're going to Creative Commons Summit in Lisbon, one of my colleagues is running a workshop, workshop on this exact thing, so get in touch with me after if you want. Uh, but it affords a glimpse of what a more robust, shared global data infrastructure might look like, which could provide clearer operating procedures for the public domain. 
But of course, this isn't only about copyright and data modeling. More fundamental for that, uh, excuse me. More fundamentally, it's about mindset and cultivating recognition by governments, institutions, and other knowledge holders of the value of the public domain and the imperative to remove all barriers to its access. Late last year, our chapter in Israel, after many years of, start, of trying to start collaborative conversations with archives that had digitized public domain photography, basically forced this recognition. These archives have been refusing to share public domain material, actively obstructing access through watermarks, technical download barriers, and restrictive terms of use. Frustrated with the situation and wanting to start a public discussion about the role of archives in sharing the public domain, the chapter boldly downloaded and shared unambiguous PD assets on Wikimedia Commons. And this is not a new tactic. Exposing the presence of public domain content and the ineffectiveness of defensive restriction is a tactic adopted by activists in the open movement all over the world. This includes Aaron Swartz, who's immortalized over there, who we heard about very movingly from Larry Lessig earlier today, and Wikimedia communities in the UK and elsewhere using FOIA requests to show institutions how restricting access to collections actually incurs costs while not benefiting their mission. There is a growing body of evidence and case studies that the values and approaches put forward by documents like the Open GLAM principles or conveyed through professional development frameworks like the Creative Commons certificates, which are currently being expanded to focus on GLAM institutions, actually improve the presence of institutions on the web. But what more could we be doing together to develop increased understanding of the public domain and its value, hopefully eventually removing the need for confrontation? Public Domain Day reminds us of how exciting it is to have materials that are finally unencumbered and free from restriction. Yet it, it also reminds us that what should be the most frictionless part of our digital culture is at times the most confusing to engage. As members of the free culture or big open movement, working to build a global knowledge commons on the internet, we need to ask ourselves what shared set of tools, practices, tactics, and infrastructures do we need to build collectively in order to globally advance the public domain. Thanks. Hi, I'm Amy Mason, and I'm an access technology specialist with the Lighthouse for the Blind here in San Francisco. And I am here to tell you about why I am so excited for the opening of the public domain this year. Very simply, when the past is accessible, the future is too. Let me show you a few ways. <laughs> Um, well, actually, let's talk about it real quick. The public domain is providing access for creators to inspiration. Scholars are gaining access to history. Students gaining access to what might otherwise be lost knowledge. And people with disabilities may be, for the first time, gaining access to the information in public domain materials. For instance, when we look at access to books, one of the, shall we say, granddaddies of internet culture and accessibility and public domain is Project Gutenberg, which has digitized in text format many, many famous public domain works. And the thing about text format that's so cool, electronic text, as long as it's actually text and not just pictures of the words or pictures of the book's pages, I, as a blind user, have a ton of choices for how I can use that information. I could choose to magnify the text. I could read it with the screen reader on my phone or on my computer. But it gets more fun than that through services like Bookshare, 
I can translate that text into uh, the Braille code and either emboss it so that I have a quote-unquote printed Braille book, or I can run it through and load it onto a Braille display that will allow me to actually read it electronically, but in Braille. And finally, because of our friends at LibriVox, I can also choose to listen to others who love these books as much as I, I do, read them as audiobooks, free and open to us all because these materials are now accessible to everyone in the public domain. But that's not all. I'm also excited because art is amazing. Images are beautiful. But not all of us get to appreciate um, visual medium of paintings and drawings, sketches, and photographs. Though there is a company, 3D Photo Works, who have really done an amazing job, and it's one of several. Our own media and Oh dear. <laughs> Media Accessibility and Design Lab also has been doing some fantastic work, though today I'm going to showcase um, 3D photo work simply because they're shiny. And they really perfected their work on famous public domain works. So here's a quick video demo for you. To assist the blind in creating a mental picture, 3D tactile photographic prints are embedded with sensors throughout the art. When a sensor is activated by touch, a custom audio track provides detailed information about that specific area of the art. Audio theater incorporates descriptions and effects that cause the viewer to feel as if they are a participant in the art. Here, in Eastman Johnson's version of George Washington crossing the Delaware, there are 27 sensors embedded. Three sensors provide background information on the history of the event, the artist, and the painting. 24 additional sensors provide detailed information about the people and the crossing. Here is one example. The flag depicted here and being held by future President James Monroe is the original flag of the United States, the design of which did not exist at the time of Washington's crossing. This flag's design was specified in June 1777 and flew for the first time on September 3rd, 1777, well after Washington's crossing in 1776. The historically accurate flag would have been the Grand Union flag, officially hoisted by Washington himself on January 1st, 1776. And finally, as was mentioned earlier, access to the silent era of film is going to now be something that I hope to dive into, because here's the thing. I have had a bit of a sad moment here and there today because I wanted to know what everyone was laughing at. And honestly, for me, some of the video clips were kind of like this. Uh, this You Describe platform is going to I'm going to give you a quick demo of this as well to show you exactly how it changes when we have the ability to rework these public domain pieces. So first, here's my experience today. Now, the experience with volunteer described video. 
Pretty Boop is rolling dough on the table. The fly lands on the dough, and Betty Boop rolls the dough with the fly in it. Trying to catch the fly, the dog jumps onto the dough and becomes stuck. Getting away, the fly lands on a portrait of a bald man. So, as a uh, admitted animation buff, I'm real excited by this. So, all in all, I really just wanted to encourage you all to think creatively about all the amazing ways the public domain can be used to bring access to those who've never had it before. And I wanted to provide you with resources to the uh, sites that I have mentioned and the projects. So there are links to Bookshare, LibriVox, Project Gutenberg, and um, you describe and 3D Photo Works information. And finally, if you have further questions about accessibility that we can I can point you at resources or that we at the Lighthouse can um, possibly help with designing new projects that are going to make a big difference. We have contact information at the end. I wanted to thank you all so much for letting me be here and share this with you and just geek out a little. <laughs>
I'm not extremely familiar with the United States Copyright Code, but in Europe, the entire um, corpus of copyright word doesn't mention the term public domain once. Like, it is defined by its absence, and we thought we needed to have a manifesto that can guide us that doesn't define the public domain by the absence of rights, but defines it as something positive, as something um, which has value in itself, which, and I think the previous speaker just illustrated how extremely important the public domain is for many of us to enjoy uh, uh, works of culture and knowledge. And uh, in doing so, um, with the public domain manifesto, um, we've chosen to uh, not only positively describe it, but we're also having a, a slightly expansive view of the public domain. Um, in the public domain, we're not only including the classical public domain, the things that um, fall out of copyright, like the works from 1923 now, or the things that never obtain copyright permission, but importantly also the stuff that's voluntary dedicated to the commons, and uh, even more importantly, I think, also in the light of the speaker uh, before, um, works that are available under exceptions and limitations to copyright, such as fair use. It can't be that people who are not able to consume uh, uh, copyrighted work the, the, the normal way are blocked from doing so by the law um, until 70 years after the death of an author. That should be pretty much immediately the case for, for obvious reasons, right? Um, so um, the, the public domain manifesto for us is something that was important in our work of setting down like the principles. Um, and it served as a guideline. So we've got like a couple of, 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 of relatively high-level principles in there that have guided um, a movement uh, over the years. And when we um, discovered halfway last year that actually that was almost the 10th anniversary this year um, of the Public Domain Manifesto, we went to reread this. And I mean, I've written or contributed to writing a lot of things 10 years ago that I think, yeah, maybe this doesn't deserve a relaunch in a new uh, website. This actually is good writing, like you can read it from top to bottom and there's nothing that I would replace at the moment. It's just a very solid document um, that owes a lot to the drafters and to the um, people involved in originally uh, creating that. And among the original signatures are Larry, are James, are Jennifer, are um, Rick Prelinger. So about half the previous speakers here have contributed to the manifesto. It's kind of like um, maybe the manifesto which brings together most of the people or, or, or this group. And um, what we've done now with this relaunch is one, we've uh, uh, made it multilingual. Over the years, like not only 3,200 signatures have accrued. At some point, like after we launched it, we stopped counting at 1,000. And then when we looked last year, again, it was suddenly 3,000. People still find that thing and sign it. And uh, if you haven't signed it, a lot of people here in the room probably have, you can still sign it. So go to the Public Domain Manifesto and sign it. We have it available in 25 different translations. Like, we haven't managed to get all of them up on the, on the website before. This was people, like, sending us translations in, and we just put, like, PDF versions on the on the old website now, it's fully integrated, so it's multilingual. You can send me translations if we don't have them yet, and we can add them to the thing. And um, as I mentioned, you can sign them. You will find like the, the names of the people I've mentioned earlier um, on this slide. So quickly, um, I've mentioned, and here's how you can sign it. It's all fully automated now. Like before, we actually had to like get emails and carry them to another server and upload them. It's a little bit easier for us. Um, and what I, what I wanted to mention, like this is a guiding principle for us. And, and so it also serves as a instrument of looking back, like what has happened in the last 10 years? How has the public domain fared when measured against the manifesto? And this is by no means complete and to some kinds it's speculative because that European copyright reform process is dragging on and on and on. Um, but the first thing which I really hope um, that it somehow miraculously passes is, I mentioned earlier, one part of that inspiration was that the public domain wasn't mentioned in EU copyright law. We actually, in this dreadful EU copyright reform process, we have at least one light point, and that is that it, the current compromise text includes a definition of, or a reference to the public domain, 
uh, in a small provision which tries to end this practice by museums to lock reproductions of public domain works away. If this copyright reform passes in its current, would pass in its current form, there are lots of dreadful things in there, but it would also, at least in Europe, um, bring a positive end to this practice of locking public domain stuff away um, by museums who are supposed to make that available to all of us and share that. Um, there's um, something we also spoke about, the need in the manifesto to make orphan uh, works and out-of-commerce works available. There's something in the EU copyright uh, uh, reform text at the moment that is going in that direction. Then, as, as Ben has just illustrated, like this open glam movement has really taken off in the years. In the public domain manifesto, we called on museums and other cultural heritage institutions to take a special role in safeguarding the public domain, and we've seen that from the Met Museum, from the Cleveland Museum, from the Rijksmuseum, from Europeana, um, all these institutions, we see more and more actually stepping up and taking this role. And I don't know if we can take credit for that, but somebody gave Larry and the movement he started, and that will be us, I guess, credit for no new term extension this year in the United States. So I think to some degree, like that's also a very positive development, right? There's bad stuff, like, um, and the same thing, like this NAFTA 2.0 uh, uh, thing is, uh, contains a extension of term of 20 years in Canada that's gonna help no one. Japan this year has introduced or has prolonged its copyright protection term from, 70 to, uh, from 50 to 70 years. Um, the EU-Mercosur trade agreement would force a number of southern American countries to increase the term of protection there. And we're also seeing this expansion of rights going on. Wherever there's a problem, the natural reaction of like the copyright industries is asking for more rights. Maybe the most concrete danger that we're having there at the moment is in the EU that would grant a completely new press publisher's rights at the request of the publishing industry, which is unproven and has tried a couple of times and has failed, but would yet again build more protection around our culture that it can't be accessed to us. So um, with this, let me thank you. This manifesto has worked pretty well for us. It's really nice to so read it and please sign it if you haven't done. Thank you so much. and. Um, over to the next speaker. So hello everyone, my name is Jane Park and I'm with Creative Commons. I was tabling at that table over there this morning. We have a lot of Creative Commons swag to give away, including limited edition stickers that we designed specifically for this event. We have boxes and boxes of it, so I encourage you to go and grab one on your way out for your family and friends. So I am here to tell the story of Creative Commons search, in particular how we are improving access to the public domain and the larger commons through search and discovery that is grounded in six months of user research. I am not here to tell the story of this Creative Commons search, which many of you know and may have used 10 or more years ago, and this is what currently sits at search.creativecommons.org, which we will change this year, but a different Creative Commons search, which we have been working on for roughly two years now, uh, first releasing this proof of concept back in February of 2017. This proof of concept, or what the startup world likes to call an MVP, uh, searched across 10 million images and five providers, initially getting that image and data set through an open API or an, a manual CSV dump. The MVP also had a few social features, like allowing a user to tag in favorite images and save their searches. The CC search was built by Liza Daly with this ultimate vision in mind, to build a front door to the commons with the ultimate goal to find and index all 1.1 billion at the time Creative Commons license works on the web. As of 2017, the last time we counted, uh, it's 1.47 billion, so it's probably more than that. Once built, the MVP did two things. It showed everyone that we could actually build something, and so then it secured us funding to take it to the next level. So I want to give a big shout out to Arcadia and Mozilla who gave us that funding to take it to the next level. So with that funding, we hired Paola Villarreal as our director of product engineering in late 2017. And we started building the next iteration, which would be this beta, which we just released this past September. Under Paolo, the ultimate vision for Creative Commons search stayed largely the same. We still wanted to catalog the entirety of the commons and eventually serve it up in meaningful and relevant ways for users. Paolo's approach towards this vision was to do so in a sequential way. 
first by laying the groundwork through a Creative Commons catalog, which would serve as a core database of content. Her approach was to initially focus on quantity over quality, to build up the universe of CC works through a combination of the common crawl data set and open APIs from providers, so that, so that eventually, once the corpus of content became large enough, she could then shift her focus to quality efforts, such as curation. While Paolo was leading this effort, I was carrying out the first large-scale user research project that Creative Commons has ever undertaken. In the span of six months, we talked to a ton of people, over 80, and then we also surveyed 36 existing interviews, and we talked to them about their motivations, their behaviors, their problems, and their ideal outcomes for sharing content online, with and without Creative Commons licensing. The research yielded nine key insights, one of which validated our earlier hypothesis for building Creative Commons search in the first place. And that insight was that people want to share and find good work, but find it difficult to navigate the abundance of content and information online. You might think that this one's a no-brainer, but the difference was that this time we had actual data to back, up, back it up, instead of just conjecture. We had 117 people telling us the same problem and need to Creative Commons, the organization. So a couple of months ago, Paolo left us for an amazing opportunity with the government of Mexico City, and I stepped into the role of director of product and research, my eighth position at Creative Commons. And just this past month, we welcomed a new director of engineering and a front-end engineer, and the CC search team now consists of five people as of January 1st, Chrissy, Sophine, Alden, Breno, and myself, um, and they are all very delightful and very talented, um, and I'm very glad to be working with them. And since September, we ran two more sprints, and we are finishing our, our first sprint of 2019 next week. And this is the current state of CC Search Beta. It searches across more than 268 million images, which includes everything from art objects to science photos, uh, most everything on Flickr, and an initial set of 3D designs under CC0 from Thingiverse. It searches across 21 providers, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Cleveland Museum of Art, which, as you all know, uh, just announced their CC0 policy this week. Uh, millions of images are tagged with Clarify, a best-in-class image classification software which provides tagging and visual recognition. And I'm required to say that because we have a marketing agreement with them, but they are also great. <laughs> we also provide one-click attribution for all of the images on CC Search and public list creation and sharing. So this is a demo of a search. It's unfortunate it started off on the Google Doc, but uh, you can try it out yourself at ccsearch.creativecommons.org. We chose the Cleveland Museum of Art for this demo because, as I mentioned, they announced CC0 for their public domain collection online this, uh, this just two days ago, on Wednesday. So following in the footsteps of museums like the Met Museum and Rick's Museum, who have been leading the way in that uh, regard. So as we partner with more institutions to get their public domain collections online, I would love to pose a uh, question to you, the audience, and to hear back from you how you think that Creative Commons and our partner organizations should be thinking about discovery, but more importantly, reuse of the public domain and the larger commons. So where should we focus our efforts, and where do you think we can make the biggest impact? Because we are at an inflection point right now with the vision and strategy for Creative Commons search. On the one hand, we have this beta image search with an ultimate grand vision that has not changed much. We still want to build that front door. We still want to index all 1.47 billion or more CC license and public domain works in the commons. But it kind of matters where we build this door. The ultimate vision is great, but we need something a little bit more specific to work towards. We need to build the door in a way and in a place that's actually useful for people. So on the other hand, we now have actual data and user research to help us get more specific. We're going to start with a vision for Creative Commons Search one year out, which will integrate the other eight key insights from user research, which you can read all about at this link, bit.ly. It's my post on the user research we did over six months. But as a preview, I will, um, and as food for thought, I'll go over a couple of them here that we're thinking of including in CC Search or already have. The first one is that people are motivated to give credit to other people, but they find attribution complicated and a hassle. Also seems like a no-brainer, but now we have the data to back it up and to prioritize it, and we have, we have one-click attribution for all images in CC Search. How can we make this one-click attribution better? Can it be no-click attribution? Can we make the attribution work across different kinds of media and platforms? Another insight that is especially relevant because we are currently standing inside the Internet Archive is that people have a desire to create work that is lasting and meaningful, that eventually has a life of its own, but they don't know what to do with a work beyond publishing it. 
So should Creative Commons provide archiving as a service for individuals in collaboration with a partner like the Internet Archive? Yes. <laughs> Great. So we, 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 we did one thing today. <laughs> And there are more insights where that came from. But in general, we're going to work from the hypothesis that users come to Creative Commons Search not to, just to discover any work on the web, because they could easily use Google for that, but to discover and reuse free resources with greater ease and with greater confidence. So we are going to be publishing our new vision and strategy for Creative Commons Search next month, uh, which will have a lot more detail and specific user groups prioritized. But in the meantime, what you can do is join us um, on Slack at Creative Commons, the CC Usability channel, where we have Feedback Fridays every Friday of, a, of an active sprint, which is one going on right now. And you can also just shoot me a note at jane at creativecommons.org. It's an alias. I can shut off access to the email anytime if I think I'm getting overloaded. So feel free to email me. <laughs> But thank you, but thank you especially to these creators of CC license and public domain works from the commons that are used for this talk. Hi everyone. My name is Paul Sulelis and I'm here from Providence, Rhode Island, where I uh, teach at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and for the last three weeks, I've had the real pleasure of being an artist in residence here at the Internet Archive. So thank you, Brewster and Wendy and everybody here for making this a very, very special experience. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project of mine, Queer Archive Work, and how it intersected with the public domain here during my time at the Internet Archive. Um, we tend to think about archives, I think, like this. This isn't an actual archive, this is an artwork. Uh, but places of deep abundance, um, rich sites that house a multitude of perspectives. This can certainly be true, um, but archives are also sites of erasure, allowing some voices to be amplified while others are minimized or excluded when they don't fit into normative narratives. Traditionally, stories involving people of color, queer people, and other historically marginalized voices have been left out of archives or diminished because of ignorance or homophobia or racism. Histories aren't discovered in archives. Rather, we use archives to actively construct versions of history stories that accommodate our own subjectivities and ideologies. All too frequently, these stories favor the familiar structures of oppression, whiteness, patriarchy, and capitalism. Likewise, um, the public domain is a remarkable construction that allows us to define who is or isn't included in these normative narratives. The public domain proclaims certain intellectual property as owned by no one. Cultural material in the public domain theoretically belongs to everyone. As copyright law enables new content to enter the public domain each year, it's important to look closely at which voices are amplified in the celebration of open culture. There is no actual public domain. There is no site or territory or designation that reflects an authentic condition of making public. Rather, as we've been hearing all day, it's a legal status created by those who control access. The institutions that define the public domain, museums, libraries, courts, archives like this one, give or deny access to these materials that have been designated as open and available. But as an institutional construct, the public domain can easily fail to reflect any true nature of the public. Without careful consideration, access to the public domain ends up repeating and perpetuating in a highly predictable way those same oppressive structures that govern society and culture. So what can be done? It's crucial that we carefully examine our archives and search for lost voices, stories of failure, 
nonlinear trajectories, and other non-conventional perspectives. We must refuse to accept traditional timelines at face value and work to amplify marginalized material that has otherwise gone unnoticed or even erased. When confronting an archive or any presentation of historic content, I think it's irresponsible not to ask urgent questions like, what is this material's relation to power? Who has been excluded? Who else should be included here in order to better understand the cultural context? Once engaged, we can actively work to change the shape of history, giving it dimension and depth and greater representation for all who were involved. This is what I call queer archive work. I'm really grateful to the Internet Archive for inviting me to help shape their effort to present newly available material in the public domain. During my residency here for the last three weeks, I've been searching archive.org, in particular for evidence of African American culture, Native American culture, very early LGBTQ voices, and other artifacts, all from 1923, that in the past would have been forgotten or actively left out of celebrations like this one today. If something seemed to be missing, I tried to find it elsewhere and add it to archive.org. Many of the items that you've been seeing up here were uploaded by me in the last two weeks. Remarkably, I found the very first open openly lesbian book of poetry ever published. Uh, that was in 1923 by the Bay Area poet Elsa Gidlow. It's titled On a Gray Thread. It's a very rare book and it had never been digitized, but I was able to find the author's original copy of the book here in her papers in San Francisco in the GOBT Historical Society archives. They put me in touch with the author's estate and they sent a PDF for me to upload. So the entire book is now online as of a few days ago. <laughs> the result of my time here is this publication, which includes all of the artifacts you've just been seeing up here with Wikipedia descriptions and a text by me. Um, I'm really proud that the Internet Archive helped me to produce this queer archive work, issue number two, two, 1923, Internet Archive Edition, is being distributed here today. I think many of you already have a copy. It's an edition of 100 copies that I edited, designed, and printed myself um, at a small press in Berkeley. All of the items I found are now available on archive.org. If you grab a copy of the zine, all the URLs are in there. By bringing these almost forgotten artifacts together in the form of a publication, my hope is to create a place for voices and positions to co-mingle. It's a collection made possible by the Internet Archive, and by printing it, I'm slowing the material down for you to get a closer look. I think by doing more of this work, we can challenge what we think or assume we know about the early years of the 20th century and imagine other kinds of histories. In our current political climate, where our relationship to information and truth is precarious, to say the least, I see this work as a form of resistance. It's barely a scratch in the surface of history, but it makes a difference, and we need to do much, much more. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and to all of our lightning talkers. Be sure to check out the exhibit of Paul Zine downstairs in the boardroom. And there might still be one or two copies left. If you want to learn more, go to blog.archive.org, and you can read about this remarkable work. So I'm going to ask our panelists, we have five of them, to come get settled while I introduce them. Now, you may not realize this, but you owe this group quite a bit. You do. 
It's because of this group that you can sing happy birthday and a video and post it without being in violation of copyright. <laughs> Corinne McSherry over there, she was part of a team from EFF that made sure that Woody Guthrie's This Land is Our Land still belongs to you and me. Why law and the public domain? I mean, isn't it kind of straightforward? Well, it turns out it is not so straightforward. And this group is going to explain it to you in all its variety. It turns out, right, that there are things that are born into the public domain. There are things that are fragile. There are things that um, are impacted by various degrees. Sorry, can we stop this? Oh, that's OK. No problem. I think we're missing one panelist. Joe Grotz, were you busy defending somebody? Right, right, coming straight from the corner. Yes, yes. It is a complicated landscape, but this group is going to help us to navigate that. As I mentioned, Corinne McSherry, she is the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. All right. It indeed was Daniel Schacht, who was one of the lawyers who helped make sure that Happy Birthday certifiably is in the public domain. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Urban from UC Berkeley School of Law. She helped make sure that a digital archive exists of the historical documents from the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you. <laughs> Our late arrival, Joe Grotz. He has been very busy defending our very good friend, Carl Malamud, along with Corinne. Thanks to his winning case, um, defending Carl, we now know that you can access state legislature um, laws that even have annotations and citations that you can't put those behind paywalls. So congratulations. <laughs> and finally, a woman who needs no introduction in this house, Pam Samuelson. She is a professor at law at Berkeley. She is the founder of the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley and many other clinics across the country. And she is the president of the Authors Alliance. Pam, take it away. So we're all very happy to be here today. And um, I think for our lawyers, it's very heartwarming to see that there are lots of people who love the public domain besides us. Um, uh, and so uh, we're, we're especially happy to uh, celebrate. And uh, while we are going to uh, have a set of questions and, and have some interactions here, um, uh, I want to make sure that you know that those little index cards, uh, you can fill them out if you have questions, uh, and people will be uh, wandering around to, uh, to get questions that you might want to put to us. Um, I know that um, uh, Mr. Copyright uh, was here earlier today uh, to answer questions, but, uh, but so are we. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have a great group of panelists uh, to talk about um, uh, the law of the public domain, because uh, the public domain is actually a legal construct, and uh, people like us have to actually make judgments uh, about whether or not something is or is not in the public domain in the United States. Uh, fortunately, all those uh, 23 and earlier things uh, uh, that have been published are in the public domain. That's easy, uh, but uh, I think one of the things we're going to talk about is both obstacles to the public domain and also um, uh, uh, how we can try to overcome them. But before we get into those legal weeds, uh, we thought we actually would have wanted to start with uh, something kind of more fun, which is kind of, today we're celebrating the, the birth of the, uh, the public domain through copyright expiration again. Uh, but uh, there are millions and millions and millions of works that uh, are in the public domain that maybe we don't think about uh, as public domain, but let's celebrate a few of those. And uh, I think, Jennifer, you wanted to I share a start. few things. 
Okay, great. I'm so delighted I get to start because I'm going to talk about something that Professor Boyle mentioned earlier today, Section 105 of the U.S. Copyright Act, which is one of my very favorite sections of the U.S. Copyright Act. So <laughs> let's hear it for Title 17 of the United States Code, Section 105, which makes all works created, with a few exceptions, of course, I'm a lawyer, by the United States government automatically in the public domain. And what does that mean? That means that there are millions upon millions upon millions of valuable cultural and scientific artifacts that are automatically in the public domain. And as Professor Royal mentioned, this is not the case in every country. It's not the case in a lot of countries. Other countries will claim crown copyright or some sort of government copyright in their works. So it is an interesting and wonderful example of the way that our government has managed to be incredibly um, uh, insightful and have foresight for the future. We have a couple of examples that are visual, um, just to give a sense of, of the broad range of things here. Many people are aware that the Works Project, uh, Project Administration uh, during the uh, New Deal era uh, of the Depression sponsored a lot of projects around the United States to get back to work. The range of projects they sponsored and the cultural value of those projects is not always as apparent um, as it is from a few famous things. So they had, um, and this is um, an image of a couple of artifacts from this project, a national theater project that actually hired artists, it hired set designers, it hired actors, it hired directors, and it put on plays all around the country in order to put people back to work. All of the materials are in the public domain. Here you have a playbill from Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe and a costume design from the production of that play in 1935, which was directed by Orson Welles. The next image probably needs no introduction, but for anyone who um, can't see it, this is a very famous photograph called Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange, um, which was also part of the New Deal uh, um, projects. This photo was in the public domain as soon as it was taken. And within weeks, it was in newspapers across the country, and the government provided food relief um, for the people in the migrant camp where the photo was taken. It has never gone out of the public eye, and it has provided the possibility and the sort of the uh, fodder for the public to discuss issues of race. The woman was at first thought to be white, but it turns out she was Cherokee. What does that mean? exploitation of the poor, poverty generally, and many other things. And that's because, in no small, uh, for no small part, it was born in the public domain. But this photo, I find, I mean, everyone knows Migrant Mother, but there are 170,000 plus of these photos um, from the 1930s to the 1940s. The one on the left here is a Rosie the Riveter kind of photo, but of an African-American woman, not the white woman we usually see. Um, and it's from the Office of War Information um, from 1942, I think. And the one on the right, I just think is hilarious because it's such a, such a stereotypical American cowboy, this is who we are um, kind of image. That is also from the Office of War Information um, in 1943 and was taken by the very famous photographer Lee Miller. So beyond these photographs, there's much cultural ephemera and cultural products. There are oral histories, many, many oral histories, including 2,300 from people who had originally lived in slavery. Um, there are all of the things that go with the plays, the histories, um, uh, c reports on different countries. You were saying um, that you found the travel logs that the government produced really interesting. There's just masses of this information, all of which um, is available for all of us free to use. And then uh, the last visual, whoops, it, again, needs no introduction. Um, this is Earthrise, uh, taken by, I always have to look, I don't want to mess up attribution, I always get the astronaut wrong. William Anders of the Apollo 8 mission, one of the most important photographs um, of the 20th century. It has been called the most important environmental photograph of all time. But it also represents all of the scientific information, the scientific reports, all of the massive amounts of important um, information that the government produces and is available to all of us for free. So section 105 is my favorite non-term limit part of the copyright 
of the public domain. <laughs> I do have a favorite public domain thing, um, although it's somewhat contested at the moment. Um, but my favorite public domain thing is actually the law. Um, and <laughs> Um, but it's actually kind of important to, to, to notice it because, of course, laws have authors. People write them, right? Um, sometimes lobbyists, sometimes legislators, lots of people write laws. So they have authors and there's a way in which um, you could have a copyright policy in which you would actually claim ownership in the law. Um, but of course, that would be a terrible idea, right? And law, I mean, I mean not just laws um, like the Constitution, um, but also like judicial opinions and regulations and codes and basically all of the rules that we have to follow um, as members of, of the United States. And you could have a rule that said that um, someone could own that. But that seems crazy, right? Because you also have a due process right to be able to access the rules that you're supposed to obey so that you could know what those rules are. And if somebody could own the law, if they could have copyright in the law, then they could sell, you'd have to buy it, right? You'd have, a, have to pay money to have access um, to, to understand what your obligations are as a citizen of this country. So we have a sensible, thank God, copyright policy that says no. In fact, one of the, the earliest um, copyright decision from the Supreme Court started that tradition and said that, of course, judicial opinions can't be owned, can't be copyrighted. It's, uh, it's actually just one sentence um, this, the court says is the unanimous opinion of, of this court that the law judicial opinions cannot be copyrighted because it was so obvious to them. They didn't think they needed to like, write a big long thing about it. it was, of course you can't own the law. Um, but as I think we'll talk about a little bit later, um, that's actually become something of a contested issue um, at the moment. Should I talk about that now or shall we wait? Let's, let's wait. If we, okay, but yes, the law. So Joe or Daniel, do you want to chime in uh, um, on this, uh, your favorite public domain? <laughs> I, I have a concept I'll mention, and I actually brought something. Um, one of the things I think that jeopardizes the public domain is when people create and, and try to copyright derivative works uh, as a way to use something that is in the public domain. And, and sometimes it's legitimate that you can add your unique original element and then you have a copyrightable element yourself. Um, and you get to enjoy that right. But this is from a case uh, where somebody, a, a toy manufacturer said, hey, you can't use this toy. Um, somebody was making similar products. And the court actually said, no, 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 this is way too similar to the actual Donald Duck that appears in print. And not that, Don not that Donald Duck is in the public domain. But the concept that I thought was great is, is this idea that, look, when you create a derivative work, you really need to, um, have something more, because we do need to protect the public domain. We can't allow people to make small variations um, and thereby recapture a whole new term of copyright. So um, that's my, my uh, thought for the day on, on public domain. Uh, so my favorite public domain piece of the, of the Copyright Act, unfortunately, isn't in the Copyright Act anymore in some respects. Um, we've been talking a lot today about uh, things that fall into the public domain through expiration of the term of protection, which is, you know, why today is special. Um, and things that were born in the public domain, like laws and government works. But there's, it, when we're talking about the 20th century, we can get a lot of things into the public domain and, and learn and discover a lot of things in the public domain um, through the, the operation of formalities. And we haven't, we haven't actually talked much about formalities today. Can we have three cheers for formalities? And then I'll, and, and let me tell you, now that you've cheered for them, let me tell you what, what I'm talking about, right? What, what I'm talking about here is uh, things like the requirement of notice. Um, or some way to cure a lack of notice, or something falls into the public domain if you didn't put notice on it. The requirement, uh, f for example, for renewal of a copyright registration after 28 years or 14 years uh, uh, in, in a, a long time ago, um, such that if you're not exploiting it, if you're not doing anything with it, if you don't care enough to show up and, and, and say, yeah, I still want it, it falls into the public domain for all of us to use. And one of the, one of the things I think we're going to be talking about, but my favorite sort of 
kind of public domain work from the, from the 20th century is things where formalities have expired because it, it makes my, my, my deep economist's heart happy that, that we were able to find the efficient solution, put a tiny cost on something, find out somebody wasn't willing to pay it, and then give it to the public. Yeah, so you used to have to, used to, have to opt in to copyright by putting the notice on it. And really, for any work that's published uh, prior to 1989, if it doesn't have a proper copyright notice on it, it's in the public domain. So there's more in the public domain uh, than just the stuff that uh, comes from 1923. Just to add on to that, I represent a lot of musicians who obviously uh, do care a lot about copyright. But um, I think it's entirely appropriate to say that if you care, you need to take some steps to do that. Um, and I thought uh, back in the day when it was 28 years and then you have to renew, there's a real, you know, for economists it's a great idea because if it's, there's so many works out there that are, you know, the value is used up very quickly um, and, and we then benefit if they're in the public domain, right? The, the, we as a culture benefit when other people can use it. And so little things like that can really help provide clarity about what's in the public domain, but also still allow authors who do want to protect their works, give them the opportunity to keep that copyright. So I think from an artist's perspective, those are perfectly reasonable steps to ask them to take. So we're all people who like the public domain and defend the public domain, but I think we have to admit that sometimes the law puts obstacles um, uh, to the public domain, and so maybe we should confess, uh, not that it's our fault, but, um, but as lawyers we should confess that we're part of the problem. So, Joe, did you want to yeah. chime in? So, so returning to formalities, you th would think that these things would be easy, right? That is, even term of protection. When was this published? How, how can I count, how can I tell whether this was published in 1923 or 1924, such that I need to find some other reason it was in the public domain? Well, for a lot of things you can look at them uh, and you can just see, but that doesn't always work. And, and then for, um, uh, for renewal, for example, and other formalities, it can sometimes be hard to tell. Um, and it can be hard to be sufficiently sure. So one of the things that, that I think we as, as uh, that the legal system does less well than it could is giving certainty that once you sort of have a pretty good idea that something is in the public domain, that it really is. Daniel, I know you wanted to uh, say a few things about this too. Sure, um, uh, certainly the, the happy birthday case that I worked on, um, was part of that, right? It, 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 that's a song that came out in 1893 um, uh, by the Hill Sisters, you know, very, I, I think she should be credited for doing a great uh, piece of work there. Uh, but the authors, you know, who authored the lyrics is unclear. It didn't show up um, until maybe 10 years later. And it was part of a kindergarten movement. And, and my own personal belief is that it probably just evolved in, in classrooms as this song and others were used to commemorate special days. Um, so, but then it appears later in, in publications, but that were probably unauthorized. And if it's unauthorized, then it's still, uh, you know, probably subject to, to copyright. And it wasn't until we spent a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, four different law firms working on it, um, at the, in, in, in litigation terms, the eve of trial, uh, we got another document dump, and in that document dump was a uh, sheet music, and in that sheet music was a part that was blurred out, and we managed to find the original 1922 copy of it, and there it said, uh, there was this song, Happy Birthday, with lyrics, and then the part that was blurred out was by permission of the publisher. So we found kind of the smoking gun, but it took us a long time, a lot of money, a lot of effort to figure this out, I mean, certainly, this is not something that people should have to do in order to claim a work in the public domain. Um, very briefly, I also mentioned, I saw earlier, the Rosie the Riveter. If you look at Rosie the Riveter, I don't want to give Westinghouse any ideas, but that's a Westinghouse, um, it's not a government work, as I understand it. That was a Westinghouse print. It was done for internal uh, purposes. And then you, get the, you can get five lawyers with five different opinions on to, as to whether that's a publication. Uh, and so, what are you going to do? I mean, thankfully, Westinghouse seems to have no interest in claiming that copyright. But if you come to us like a private practitioner and, and want clearance on something, 
you're probably going to get a maybe. You're probably not going to get a green light or a red light. You're going to spend a fair amount of money for our opinions. And it, it becomes a risk analysis that in many ways deters people from actually using things that probably are in the public domain. Jennifer Urban uh, has done some studies about orphan works and also about a guide to the public domain. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sadly, I can only back up Joe and Daniel about the difficulty of actually making formalities work for you. The inimitable and brilliant Leela Bailey and I supervised a clinic project a few years ago where we created a guide to understanding whether something that you came across was in the public domain um, because of a lack of compliance with the formalities. And I'm here to say it is, it is an incredibly um, complicated situation. It is a particularly complicated situation for orphan works. Those works that have been disconnected from their authors or their owners, often because, as the economist Joe explained, they don't have an economic interest in exploiting them anymore. Therefore, it would be far more efficient, as well as obviously far more culturally valuable to make them available for use um, by others. But because of the fact that they've been disconnected from their owner, there actually is no way to clear um, those works. There is no way to go forward with 100% certainty. It would be very difficult to get a lawyer to give you, you know, a very strong opinion, and then you are existing in a world of risk of some sort. As you might guess from the photos that I chose, I think ephemera, the, the, the things of life, the diaries, the family photographs, the things that are most likely to become orphan works are incredibly culturally valuable. So this is really troubling to me. The other thing that I really worry about with the public domain is in addition to the late 20th century shrinking of the public domain, that we might start taking things back out. And I hate to be you know, the sort of depressing bad news bear here. But a few years ago, um, we did actually do that um, with Section 514 of the Uruguay Round Agreement Act, works that had been in the public domain for many years because they were created by foreign artists and we didn't recognize the copyright, were taken back out of the public domain. And despite a really courageous lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court saying that this was a First Amendment problem, that you would have to say that there is a vested public interest in these works and there is a vested speech interest that the public has in these works because they are in the public domain. The Supreme Court said, nope, that's fine. Congress can do that. They can remove these works from the public domain. Um, so that's probably my biggest barrier concern at the moment. Well, legislatures sometimes go ahead and try to make things like law into uh, proprietary stuff. And maybe you can say a few words about that, Corinne. Yeah, so um, so, yeah, so my client, um, Carl Malamud, well, uh, has an organization called publicresource.org. And public resource is dedicated to making uh, government works available online to everybody um, in a more accessible format often. Um, so for example, print disabled people can ac get access to them. And as part of that, um, part of that work, he, has, he puts um, the law online. And um, over time, he has um, begun to get a lot of pushback from state legislators, um, for example, who claim copyright in, um, in their law. So the state of Georgia claims a copyright in the law of the state of Georgia and, um, and is trying to enforce that copyright. And there's a way in which that's almost insane, right? If you are um, a citizen of Georgia, surely you should not have to pay money to find out what the rules are that you have to live by. Um, there's something sort of so intuitive about that, but apparently not in Georgia. Um, so, um, Lots going on in Georgia, anyway. So, so it you know so it's turned into into, um, into active litigation, and and then there's another case. Um, where, uh, credit to um, Elizabeth Rader, who's not here, but she's been one of the and Vera Edelman of the ACLU. They've been working on that case, and then another case that Joe and I are working on. There uh, is another set of rules and regulations that are. Um, very, very actually probably the rules that we most interact with on our day-to-day -day level, which are just sort of basically codes, like the fire safety code, the national electric code, um, all the sort of rules and regulations that make our products safe, that make our homes safe, um, hopefully, if they're followed. Um, 
those are usually developed or often developed um, not by uh, legislators, but by standards bodies. They develop these codes and regulations and then they have them adopted into law. And once they're adopted into law, they're binding um, just like the Constitution or the tax code or anything else. But the standards bodies that own those uh, regulations um, believe that they have a copyright in them and that even when they're made into law, they can sell them and they can control access to them. Um, and then that is what they do. So um, public resource said that seems wrong to us. It's the law, and if it's the law, then there's lots and lots of cases that say the law should be made freely available to the public, that the people are ultimately the authors of the law, whether it's written by a lobbyist or a senator or a standards organization and then ultimately adopt it. Um, and there too, we've been involved in um, several years now of litigation, um, trying to explain to courts that there's a limit to copyrightability. And once something is made law, it enters the public domain. And I always sort of push back on that phrase of fall into the public domain, because it always seems sort of like it's sad, like, oh, it fell, too bad. Um, <laughs> You know, rather, it enters the public domain. It becomes part of our vibrant, common culture that sort of shapes our, our world. Um, so, that's the, that. We could go on. Uh, we could go on about that. Time. But the point is um, that so the courts are sometimes uh, and copyright holders have been an obstacle to um, to the public domain. But but that fight, those fights are not over. So I think we have to move on to the, uh, the last question uh, that I was going to put to you, and, and that is, uh, what is it that we can do as lawyers to help all the folks who want to get more things in the public domain? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the various strategies uh, that, uh, that we as lawyers can recommend or help with? So I have two answers to that question. Um, one of them is uh, practical and highly unofficial. And one of them is perhaps impractical, but very official. Um, I'll start with the impractical one. Um, and that is, um, we just saw, as Brewster told us, in the Music Modernization Act, there is a ray of light in there. And that is that the, that leg the legislature put in uh, basically a safe harbor for non-commercial use of certain works that are covered by a, a provision of the Copyright Act. And we, that may reflect an opening or an openness or at least, at least the possibility of doing the same thing with respect to things that are probably in the public domain, right? That is, the public domain as an abstract matter is yes or no, but as a practical matter, there are shades of gray. And you shouldn't have to get all the way to yes in order to, to be able to be confident using something. So one thing, that, one thing that, that it would be great to see, both with respect to public domain determinations that might have been done in good faith, but might not be 100% certain, and de determinations of, of orphan work status, um, would be some kind of safe harbor, such that if, uh, if a rights holder shows up after you've been doing something, and they say, hey, actually, I own that here. I can, I can show you. I actually did renew that, and it was filed wrong and you didn't find it, that maybe you can stop or maybe you can pay a reasonable royalty, but they can't get statutory damages of up to $30,000 a work from you, and you don't have to be worried about that. So that's, that's the, the official, maybe impractical strategy. The unofficial, um, more practical strategy is be bold, right? If you're acting in good faith, people are not going, uh, most copyright holders are people of good faith who do not want to go after people who are acting in good faith, who are not harming their legitimate economic interests. And so if you're doing something, even pretty boldly, that is that, that you ha believe and have a basis to believe uh, and a reasonable basis to believe is in the public domain or is fair use, going out and doing it is the way, um, is the way forward rather than being endlessly afraid.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in. Um, uh, Authors Alliance has been doing a lot to try to empower authors to uh, make their works more available through getting rights reversions. So if something is not commercially active, um, uh, very often, even if you've assigned your copyright to somebody else, uh, you can write to them and say, I see that you're not making any money from this and I'm not making any money either, so why don't you give me the rights back and I'll put it uh, up on a digital archive and make it available for people because there's still some good information in it. And so rights reversion and terminations of transfer um, are things that uh, the law really allows uh, people to, uh, to do uh, public domain dedication uh, through CC0 uh, after they've gotten uh, rights uh, reverted. So Daniel, did you wanna chime in? I did, uh, just to offer a slightly different that we want to be able to use material. And I think the public domain is one, but also speaking as somebody who, who was an artist, uh, I played music for a while, and, and again, my clients are in that basis. Um, there's a lot, legislatively, I think, to Joe's point, to Pam's point, if, if you allow for efficient ways to, to allow people to use material, and if there's money made to compensate the original authors, uh, I think that benefits everybody. I think we see too much of one or the other. Either it's, um, it's far too difficult to, to determine if it's in the public domain, so you end up stuck. You can't set aside money that you think would be fair. On the other hand, you do find a lot of companies, a lot of very large companies, making a lot of money uh, that goes into their pockets when that should be distributed to authors, both of the original works and to new authors who are doing more with it. So I think legislatively, if we make it easier uh, in that way, and my big, I'm a big fan of Section 115. If you want to do a cover song, you pay the artist. It's very simple. It's very easy. Uh, I think the more we do of that, um, the better off we are as a society, and the more we can, uh, more cultural works we can have. I think a um, good and uh, readily available, brilliant middle ground options that we've talked about today. Um, there are the Authors Alliance initiatives that empower our authors and artists. Obviously, there's Creative Commons, the brilliant idea that seemed crazy at the time to those of us who are copyright lawyers, but has really empo empowered people to make decisions um, to make their works available. Um, and there is the, I, over time, um, more usable form of fair use that has emerged in the courts as they have had more um, good cases to consider, to Joe's point, to take a risk. You need that good case law. But there are also the wonderful best practices and fair use by uh, Peter Yazzie and Pat After Heidi at the American University that re rely on a really robust um, method of going around to different creators' communities and finding what they need and developing a statement that is not 100% of fair use. It's not everything that you could do but it is a reasonable statement of things that people in that community often need to do. And the more lawyers can help artists and can help historians and can help librarians with this sort of middle ground um, space, I think the better. One thing that's really good about these best practices guides is that for the most part, they involve communities of creators and really what kinds of problems do they frequently encounter where fair use might be a, a good solution for them and then to provide some guidance with little scenarios about this is probably fair use if you do this and if you do this. And, um, and that then creates a community consensus about uh, about fair use uh, that I think is very, very helpful. Uh, so, um, so do look at some of those best practices guidelines. I think they are very, very useful. Corinne, did you want to add anything in terms of sort of what can we lawyers do to help other than litigate? <laughs> um, well, from my perspective, one of the things that lawyers could do to help is to stop sending DMCA takedown notices for public domain material. <laughs> which I'm sure no one in this room would ever do, but we see it at EFF all the time. It's very, NASA pictures, for example, have received takedown notices regularly. And I think adding, adding on to that, and this is something that, that Corinne, you've been, you've been huge in, um, using, uh, using the tools that the Copyright Act gives us, like Section 512F, to fight back against 
um, encroachments on. How do we fight back against encroachments on the public domain? One way is there's a, there's a part of the Copyright Act, Section 512F, that says if you send a takedown notice uh, that you don't reasonably believe is right, like, for example, it's for that, right? You, you'll be liable for damages and attorney's fees. Um, and, and Corinne recently uh, won a very important case making sure that attorney's fees are in there so that the, um, uh, so that the consequences are real and there's the ability to get help uh, and deal with those when they're needed. Um, something that uh, I find very useful and I want to say is, is, is what everybody can do is, is what I see on Wikipedia when you've seen the analysis of the rights. Uh, it's a great starting point for lawyers when they're trying to tell their clients, hey, can I use this or not? Because trying to figure out when something was published, who, who is the author still alive, was the co where, where all these facts that you need to do your analysis, Wikipedia, there's a lot of great contributors who've done a lot, uh, and some of them really stake the public um, domain flag on works, which I think maybe from a legal perspective, you think, okay, a lit litigation might prove that different, but effectively, uh, it can be a very practical way to say, you know what, this is pretty low risk, and y you don't need to pay a lawyer to, to <laughs> look at that and say, I think this is, uh, because of all the work that people have done to research that, um, it really can help push the public domain forward. So that's something that everybody can do. Okay, so we got a whole bunch of questions from the, from the audience, so I think uh, we'll get started with, the, with some of those. So I'm actually gonna answer this one first because it's really easy. Um, and I like easy ones. Um, so please explain why all books from 1923 and earlier in the public domain, an earlier speaker mentioned 70 years after the death of the author, which seems to be a different rule. So that's probably a good one to make sure that everybody knows the answer to that. Um, so uh, prior to the, uh, the effective date of the Copyright Act, which uh, came into force in January of 1978. Works that had been created before then were uh, in copyright for a period of years, renewable for a period of years, and they didn't change that to life of the author plus 50 years. Uh, only the works that were created from January 1, 1978 going forward were life of the author plus 50 years, and then the Copyright Term Extension Act added another 20 years on that, which is why it's life plus 70 now. So, so the reason that we can celebrate the, the public domain is because we know that all the works that were published in 1923 are in the public domain period because it was a set period of time and another set period of time, and that's it. What, we, what we're going to have trouble with next century is that it's now life of the author plus 70 years, but how do you know? when the author passed away. And, and just to add on to that, it, it could be worse in that in, f <laughs> in, in France, as, uh, as, as you know, the, it's, it's life of the author plus 70, and, and it's been going that way uh, for a long time, but also in France the rule is not, you don't just have to figure out when the author died, but if they died for France, they get an extra 30 years. <laughs> So you have to figure out not just when they died, but how and why. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel. And, uh, on that point, from a practical perspective there, uh, at least in the music world, there are no US only contracts, right? You, 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 we're talking about US law, but it, these are international. You're gonna be in, distributed internationally at the click of a button through Spotify um, and other platforms. So it's great that it's in the public domain here, but if Mexico has life plus 100 and France, you need to figure out uh, if they died for France, it, it becomes a mess. So. so here's another question. In a world of proliferating digital artifacts and no formalities uh, required for copyright, how will the next century know what belongs to the public? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, question. you can look up, at least you'll know the publication dates from the Internet Archive and elsewhere, hopefully. <laughs> Wait, Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But, yeah. but, I mean, there's, there's something really, really important to that question that, that um, isn't confined to the public domain, but I think is why copyright has, become, has gone from being a relatively sort of sleepy legal specialty to, to something that's so important is, is because, you know, in a... In the world where we are now, 
you're create people are creating copyrightable works all the time and circulating copyrightable works all the time and but no one's but it's why really we miss the formality so much because for so much of this work no one cares no one, no one you're not thinking of it like oh i've created a copyrightable work that i now own and i can control and license like none of that's going to happen um, but <coughs> we create copyrighted works just in the course of our day um, and it's kind of crazy to sort of think that oh so we have to figure out what the legal regime is that runs all of these all of these objects okay so another question is is the library public domain a recognized legal construct and what are its implications as decided by the case law formulated by acts of legislature or procedural rules right so the, so, so the library public domain was was a term that that uh, Brewster used earlier today um, to refer to the, the things that the libra that libraries can do and that the Copyright Act gives the gives libraries the right to do that people who aren't libraries can't do or can't do in the same way. And so I would say, I don't think it would be necessarily right to think of the library public domain as a status, but it's a way of thinking about the additional rights that libraries have to do things and, and to act like some things are more like public domain works um, than, uh, than non-library act. So in that sense, it's, it can be a, a useful concept, but I wouldn't say that work is in the library public domain, my, personally, myself. Although, maybe it'll catch on, you know. <laughs> this is, maybe we will make that a thing, yeah. Okay, so setting aside the current political climate, is there anything that prevents us, legal, social, or technical, from returning to an era of opt-in copyright? Um, if there was will, a political will, could we do this? Well, we absolutely should do this. I mean, it would be the absolute best reform to copyright that we could possibly make. Um, I'm, finding, I'm finding it a little bit hard to imagine away the current political will, but let's do that, and it would be a tremendous thing to do. Well, there, there is a qualification to this. Okay. okay. Well, so, I mean, we, we may be about to say the same thing. I, 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 my, my, the first time I encountered this question, this was a question that uh, Larry Lessig got when he was speaking in 2002 at the I-Law that I went to at, right after college and before law school, and it just made my brain explode. It was a week of nothing but uh, cyber law, and Larry's answer was, if I remember it right, we just need to get out of the Berne Convention. The United States needs to withdraw from the Berne Convention this treaty that says basically you can't have uh, formalities, you can't have opt-in copyright. Um, and at the time, I thought to myself, you know what? I finally, I finally heard Larry Lessig say something dumb, like I, th this had never happened before. But over time, I have now grown to realize Larry was right. That, like that, that's. That's an important piece of the answer, and the practicality of that important piece is beside the importance of that piece. Daniel. We, we have something like that already, because Bern is not self-executing, which means the text of Bern is not the law of the land. It is, it is what Congress chooses to implement. And so we already have great protections if you register your copyright, which can cost you $55. And the first question you're going to get when you go to an attorney and say, that person took my stuff, is, did you register your copyright? Because if you did, then I can send a nasty letter saying you owe us up to $150,000 and you will be paying my attorney's fees. If you do not, you will get a share of the profits. Uh, so there is something that we're already doing that I think could be built on. I think other countries will not be too happy. This is not too happy about these formalities that we still have, and we have intellectually dishonest arguments about why we use, we have them, but we're still compliant with Bairn, but we have them. So there may be ways to, to do this, to say, look, if you're in the mass of, you know, you, you doodled something on a napkin, you post it on Facebook, and somebody reuses it, okay, great. You, and if it's McDonald's and they make an ad out of it and make a million dollars, you should get a share of that. But you can't go knocking on people's door, uh, as we were talking about earlier, some of us, and send nasty letters about out to everybody who's using it and demanding $150,000. So, so there is a mechanism that's already built in there that I think can be 
expand it on and maybe even if we say, well, maybe you need to re-register after 28 years or you again lose the right for statutory damages and, copy and attorney's fees. Yeah, so I it is actually true that uh, the United States could basically pass a law uh, requiring opt-in for U.S. authors, okay? So the thing is that we can't, the Berne Convention basically um, stops us from doing that for non-U.S. authors, um, uh, but um, the political will to get there is not present right now, but you never know. May I amend, amend my answer just slightly? I was imagining the Berne Convention being washed away with everything else, but in a world where it isn't, which of course it wouldn't be, um, you can create an unfairness to U.S. authors, which I think is a concern. And the, the, But the way that I wanted to amend my answer was to say, we should bring back formalities, but we shouldn't bring back what we would call the traps for the unwary that existed with the formalities, which could make it much harder for you to get protection if you weren't sophisticated, if you weren't you know, backed up by a record label or something like that. Okay, so I've got uh, probably one minute left. Uh, it says, how, uh, a question is, how does the concept of moral rights intersect with the use of public domain works? Ah. Can, I, can I say something? <laughs> one, one of the, because again, speaking for artists um, generally, I'll, I'll just take that mantle. Uh, one of the rights they have is to say no. And I think that's, a, that's always a difficult question with public domain. Yes, there are many great uses that art can be put to, but there's also terrible uses that can be put to that artists and creators don't want to be used. So I think that's a, we do not have moral rights in this country, or, or very, very little, with very, very few exceptions. And we are, have an almost entirely economical model, and it's just something we have to live with. Well, people who care about um, attribution uh, do care about, um, uh, about the, even when the work is in the public domain. So um, it's a respect thing rather than a legal thing um, for us in the United States. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for this incredible legal panel. Thank you. So live stream audience, we are at our final, final speaker of the day. And you folks here may want to ask him some questions. So once again, we ask you to use your cards, send them up to the front, and we will get our next speaker, our final speaker, to, uh, to address that. You know, when, when we were thinking about um, who should be the final speaker, Leela and Tim, they really wanted it to be a creator. Somebody who knew in his or her, her bones what it meant to have these public domain materials at their fingertips. Who better than Cory Doctorow? Cory Doctorow, right? Absolutely. Because not only is he an author of science fiction, not only is he a journalist, editor of Boing Boing, but he is a fighter. I called him a couple nights ago and he said, oh, you know what, we think we're gonna turn Germany but it's slipping and I gotta work, go back. Because he is always in there at the forefront trying to make sure that knowledge is free, open, that we have good regulations and good laws. I understand that his 10-year-old daughter is in the audience, so I want you to give him a very big round of applause and impress her. Please welcome Cory Doctorow. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I confess that I struggled a little with how to open this talk. After all, I am sharing a bill with some of my all-time heroes and mentors, people who helped illuminate so many issues for me in a building consecrated to such a noble purpose, so audacious. And so I, I wondered, you know, should I make a joke about not coming here to praise Sonny Bono but to bury him? But <laughs> instead I thought I would talk about uh, a current affairs peg, because that always works as a way to introduce a complicated subject. You hook it into the news. So I want to talk today about grifters, uh, not, not mere con artists. Uh, grifters aren't uh, little solo bit players who do these little psychodramas on the street with their three-card Monty. They, uh, con artists are just like gabby muggers who fast talk you out of what's rightfully yours, but a, a grifter puts on the veneer of, responsibility, of respectability. He doesn't pick your pocket, 
he gets you to sign a contract saying that everything in your pockets belongs to him. And then he buys off the judge, and he does it by operating out of a made town where every cop is on the take. The grifter doesn't mount a one-man performance piece. He constructs a kind of immersive LARP in which all the trappings of law and order are present, but filtered through a kind of dream logic where if he has to pick your pockets, it's only because you don't respect the law enough to empty them voluntarily. Now, that may sound very abstract, so I want to bring it down to earth with a recent example from current events. Let's talk about Aloha Poke. So Aloha Poke, Midwestern chain, started in Chicago. They sell poke bowls, and they were founded in 2016. And they take their name from two indigenous inventions. The first one is the word aloha, which is thousands of years old. It's, its origins shrouded in uh, historic mystery, but we think it was coined on the island of Tahiki, which we now or Kahiki, which we now call Tahiti, and it spread through all Pacific Island languages. And also poke, which is a delicious mashup dish invented by Hawaiian chefs in the 1970s and spread to the mainland around 2012. Now, as you might imagine, given those two facts, there are a lot of restaurants around the world called Aloha Poke, or some variation on that, and most of them are run either by indigenous Hawaiians or people who grew up in Hawaii, or, or both. And uh, there are, uh, of all those Aloha Pokes, I, I'm sure that most of them are very respectable establishments serving delicious food, but one of them is a grift. Uh, Aloha Poke is a grift. Last year, Aloha Poke started sending trademark infringement letters to the proprietors of every other Aloha Poke, claiming that any use of the word Aloha, whether by an indigenous Hawaiian person or anyone else, was a violation of this Chicago company's sacred legal rights. They had this law firm of Olson and Sepertus uh, draft letters of such bowel-loosening efficacy that many of the Aloha Pokes around the world complied, shelling out thousands of dollars to reprint their menus, signs, and other collateral. They allowed the ancient, commonly held language to be plucked right out of their mouths. And that's a grift. A grift is what happens when the con man gets a lawyer, or a judge, or the legislature, or the president of the United States in his pocket. So this guy, John Locke, he's a key grifter thinkfluencer. <laughs> Locke's 1660 Two Treaties on Government sets out the basis by which a commons can become private property. Locke wrote this when he was struggling with theology. He wanted to square up the existence of a scripture that on the one hand described the earth as being made for the benefit of all humans, but, and on the other hand had lots of nasty things to say about rich men and needles and camels. Um, and uh, he proposed that the world is full of stuff that no one was using, and that you could make that stuff into your property by mixing it with your labor, which came from your body, which you owned. And so this sort of transitive property of ownership from your body to your labor to this stuff that no one owned would make it yours. But that stuff that no one owns, it's a funny category. In Locke world, stuff that no one owns has come to mean stuff that so many people are using that it's impossible for one person to truly say that they own it. You could never ask all the people who are using it to surrender what title they had. Locke world then has only two kinds of things in it. Private property and stuff that's waiting to become private property. And that private property has a fancy Latin name. Uh, grifters love fancy Latin words. The Latin name for it is terra nullius, no one's land. Now, terra nullius has a long history. It's what settler colonists called Australia and other so-called new worlds when they arrived, declaring that these places were empty. And you may imagine that this came as a hell of a surprise to the people who continuously occupied that land for 65,000 years throughout the entire span of, of the existence of behaviorally modern humans. So how does something that everyone is using become something that no one is using? Through erasure. Sometimes we erase the people. 
Since Australia was officially devoid of people, the indigenous people of Australia were declared to be officially not people, and thus genocide was visited upon them. And sometimes we erase the deed, not the doers. The use of aloha uh, to describe many kinds of restaurants by indigenous people is declared irrelevant because they never papered over their title, while the use of the term by someone from Chicago is elevated to sanctity because he had the paperwork. Whether or not genocide is involved, the grift always involves paperwork and a rigged process explaining why you are a lawless cur for getting between the grifter and your stuff, which is now his stuff. So let's talk briefly about copyright technology and the efforts to control expression and dissemination by the winners of the last round of the copyright wars. And there's a standard account of this that I've said many times, I've said from this podium in this room, that I call the admirals and the pirates, and it goes like this. First, there was uh, the sheet music publishers, and the sheet music publishers were taking the compositions of the composers, and they were selling them, and the composer said, you are engaged in theft, and the sheet music publisher said, why, no, it's not theft. Um, what did you think we would do with this music? Uh, so, or rather, I'm sorry. Let me start that over. First there were the sheet music publishers and then there were the recording artists. And the recording artists came along and started to record the sheet music compositions. And the sheet music composer said, what are you doing recording our compositions? And the recording artist said, well, what did you think we were going to do with these if not play them? The fact that we're playing them into this phonogram makes no difference. And then along comes the, uh, the next round of this, where the broadcasters start to take compositions that have been recorded, and they start to play them on the radio. And the uh, people who made the phonograms, who got into this big fight with the sheet music people, they say, well, when we did it, it was uh, legitimate artistic advancement, but when you do it, it's just theft. And then the broadcasters confront the cable operators, and the cable operators take these signals and suck them down with community access TV antenna, uh, 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 community antenna TV, and then they spread it around communities. And the people who broadcast, who took the phonograms, who took the sheet music, they say, what are you doing when we did it? It was legitimate artistic expression. When you do it, it's theft. And then along comes the VCR and the cable operators who objected to the broadcasters, who objected to the uh, phonograms, who objected to the sheet music publishers. They say, what are you doing with our cable signals when we took them from the broadcasters? That was legitimate. When you do it, it's theft. And then along comes Napster and file sharing and the VCR people go after the internet people and they say, what are you doing? When we took the cable signals that were taken from the broadcasters, that were taken from the phonograms, that were taken from the sheet music, that was legitimate artistic progress, but when you do it, it's theft. And I call this the pirate and the admirals because every pirate wants to be an admiral. Everyone wants to kick the ladder away, right? But, but there is another version of that story. Not pirates and admirals, but grifters gone respectable versus upstarts who don't know their place. Grifters who say, I stole this stuff fair and square, buzz off and get your own. No one is quite so indignant as a grifter being reminded that he got where he is by taking from others, which explains a hell of a lot about the violent suppression of protests at Standing Rock. We stole this stuff fair and square, buzz off. Grifting is a very law of the jungle affair. The big mon little monkey gets punched out by a bigger monkey who gets his banana, and then a bigger monkey comes along to swipe it again, and again, and again, until the biggest, most sociopathic of all the monkeys has all the bananas. <laughs> when, after all, if you're declaring something to belong to no one, it helps if the people who are using it don't have any social power to point out that it belongs to everyone. You can use this, in fact, as a kind of a test to figure out who the biggest grifters are. The biggest grifters are the ones who are papering over to the, ti the title to the stuff that they made and block everyone else from papering over the title to the stuff that they took to make it. It's not a coincidence that our Western-derived copyright recognizes melodies as copyrightable elements, but not the complex polyrhythms that are the hallmark of Afro-Caribbean music. And that's why the Beatles could make rock and roll without permission from the African-American artists who pioneered those chord progressions, those rhythms, and so on, only to, for the Beatles to have the lion's share of their rights picked off by bigger, meaner monkeys from the record companies. And now, those 
bigger, meaner types. They're the lords of the jungle who paper over their title and wave it at the hip-hop artists who sample the Beatles in order to suppress that work. Which brings me, of course, to Walt Disney. <laughs> now, I love Disney's art. And it was Larry who showed me how to love it. He, he pointed out that you can love how shamelessly Walt Disney plunders the pirate domain, freely mixing and matching elements from different works to create new stories that we tell today. Don't get me started on the dark rides and the theme parks. No one builds built environments and turns them into works of art like Disney Imagineering. So it's easy to write off Disney's central role in the confiscation of the public domain as mere hypocrisy, just ladder kicking. When we did it, it was legitimate artistic progress, but when you do it, it's piracy. But what if it's a grift? <laughs> if it were just hypocrisy, Disney would have fielded really good arguments, arguments that were compelling but one-sided about the fundamental justice of their position, sowing the kind of expensive doubt that made people uncertain of the link between smoking and cancer or uh, uh, anthropogenic climate change and CO2. Disney is perfectly capable of making those arguments. If there's one company in the world capable of coming up with compelling fairy tales, it's Disney. But back in 1998, Disney's arguments were as pro forma as today's climate denial argument. Disney knew that there wasn't any point in convincing the public that the public domain should be locked away for another 20 years. And they knew that the way to convince Congress that it had nothing, of this had nothing to do with argument or reason, it all came down to campaign contributions. It's a grift. DC is a made town. The whole thing was papered over and, and sewn up faster than you could say Boston Strangler. <laughs> so for decades, this country has marched towards a form of grifter governance. As inequality has widened, the extent to which Congress depends on a few deep-pocketed oligarchs to keep their jobs has only grown. Our policies, therefore, only get to be evidence-based to the extent that they do not gore some billionaire backers' ox. The, policy, the policies that benefit billionaires also extend their influence. So we lather, rinse, repeat our way into a future where every policy that's sized to fit through the Overton window is one that closes it a little on the way out. Now, Jamie Boyle, he calls copyright policy the evidence-free zone, and Larry Lessig famously only got Milton Friedman to sign on the Eldred brief if it could, if it could contain the phrase, a no-brainer. So it's tempting to think that copyright is this uniquely grifty uh, domain, but that would be a mistake. If there's one thing our political climate has demonstrated, it's that copyright is the canary in the coal mine, not a black swan. Climate policy, labor policy, pollution policy, pharma policy, it's grift all the way down. Copyright was just the low stakes grift that was so easy that it got picked off early. So this is not meant to be a council of despair. Our public domain is growing again and that is cause for celebration, for dancing in the streets. Because the public domain redounds to the public good and the public domain is anti-oligarchic. The commons is no terra nullius. It is for us to use together without permission from or benefit to a multinational corporation. And that it is an important victory for evidence-based policy. It is anti-grift. It is a movement that strikes directly at the power imbalances between the players, unlike, say, expansions of copyright. In an oligarchic marketplace where a handful of companies call all the shots, five publishers, soon to be four, five studios, soon to be four, four big record labels, and so on, if you give an artist more copyright, it's like giving your bullied kid more lunch money. The bullies are just going to take that lunch money too. It's not going to buy your kid any lunch. Extend the term or scope of copyright, and the media industry will just demand that us artists hand over all those new rights at the same time. The public domain is the opposite of term extension in more, than one, in more ways than one. It is raw material that artists can use without first having to enter into bondage with an entertainment conglomerate. So it's a start. But here's where we should go next. It is great to have a sensible copyright policy. But copyright's pol the most important policy isn't what the rules say, 
It's who the rules apply to. The idea that just because our dominant form of communications, the internet, involves making hundreds and thousands of incidental copies every time we do anything, that we should therefore regulate it as though it was an entertainment industry, that's a grift. Those funny alternate lyrics you think up for your favorite songs or the drawings you do of your favorite characters from art and literature or the stories you retell to your kids and your friends, those have never been part of the scope of copyright. They were offline and transient and no rights holder even knew that they were being made. The fact that all of these now take place online doesn't make us all part of the entertainment industry. So think about this. I live in Burbank, California now, and half a mile in one direction is the um, Warner lot, and half a mile in the other direction is the Universal lot. And there are lawyers at Time Warner and Universal who uh, were able to use copyright as a framework to license the Harry Potter stories to build a giant and rather good theme park at Universal Studios. Now, they needed copyright to be technical and nuanced so that they could do this very big multi-million dollar deal. And that's fine. But a set of rules that is that technical and nuanced will never be parsable by a kid living on my street in beautiful suburban Burbank who wants to write some Harry Potter fan fiction. If we make the rules easy enough for her to follow, they will be useless to Universal and Time Warner. And if we keep them useful to Time Warner and Universal, we guarantee that she will be a lawbreaker with every interaction with culture that she has. So it's a grift. When everyone is violating the rules all the time, we are all being primed to be grifted. It's a grooming technique to make victims for grifters. Because we self-police, we bow before any censorship attempt that contains the word copyright, because we know in the back of our mind that we are all copyright criminals. Now, I need to understand copyright because I'm part of the entertainment industry. I chose that, but you shouldn't have to be part of the copyright uh, of the entertainment industry. You shouldn't have to understand this abstruse body of law just because you're doing culture. Culture includes the entertainment industry, but it's so much larger and more important than the mere industrial players in our culture. And the internet, it's not just a culture mechanism any more than it's a video on demand service. The internet is the pluripotent omni-network that does everything. It's where our health and family and politics and civic life and education and romance all take place. And the grift doesn't care about that stuff. Grifters just want to flip your house, colonize your land, and steal the words out of your mouth. To paper it over in a way that seems legal, but is ultimately only legal adjacent. The grift even wants to steal the law. If you need evidence that the law is part of the grift, just remember, when Aaron Swartz and the Recap Project published public domain court records, they called in the FBI. And now the rogue archivist and American hero, Carl Malamud, is on the wrong side of lawsuits over and over because he has the temerity to publish the law so we can know what it says and follow it. Now, I am very glad that the public domain has reopened. I am so glad. But even though this is the end of decades of fighting, ever since retrospective term extension went from an evil supervillain master plan to a feature of American law, even though we used up so much blood and treasure just to get here, this is really just the start. It's barely a beachhead. It's a toehold, but it's still solid ground. It's something we can stand on while we push for the policies that benefit the many and not the few. Policies that insist that the sky is up, the earth is down, cigarettes will give you cancer, climate change is real, aloha is not terra nullius, and undoing retros retrospective copyright term extension is a no-brainer. <laughs> now, this is not the kind of fight that we win. The forces of greed and reaction and selfishness will never be abolished. This is the kind of fight that we fight that we commit ourselves to so that the fighters who come after us will build on the commons that we formed out of our victories. We need to live as though it were the first days of a better world, even and especially when things seem to be getting worse. And I want to finish with something uh, I learned from someone who's not here today, but, but who could easily have been on the bill, a guy named Jamie Love from uh, Knowledge Ecology International. And Jamie convened a very audacious meeting in Geneva one time when I was working as EFF's European director to plan out something called the Access to Knowledge Treaty 
And we gathered on a Sunday morning at Médecins Sans Frontiers offices, and someone said to Jamie, Jamie, how, why are you doing this ridiculous thing? Why, what makes you think we can write a treaty that undoes the worst excesses of burn, that guarantees access to people with sensory and physic dis physical disabilities, that rebalances the public domain and so on? Who are we to do this? And he said, look, you know the TRIPS, you know the WTO, you know all these agreements that we're fighting over, that we're fighting against, that seem so uh, insurmountable. They were formulated by people no smarter than us, no better than us, in a room just like this one, probably within a couple of kilometers of where we're standing now in Geneva. And if they can do it, we can do it. So that's what I want to finish with. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask all of the speakers to come on up. Come on up and join. Someone told me this was kind of like getting the band back together again. So let's get all of you back up on stage. Oh, Larry that sounds great. And, and Pam and Jamie, come on up. This, this is the band, the open access band. Paul, Ryan, please, please head on up. And now, I would also like to bring three special people up because more than anyone else, today's amazing grand reopening is because of Tim Vollmer, Leela Bailey, and Caitlin Olson. Please join those folks. We could not have done it without their leadership, their attention to detail, their passion, their knowledge. It has been a long time coming, folks. 20 years of fighting, of believing, of watching the gate. But today is a day to celebrate. You are the creators, you are the fighters, you are the lawyers, you are the policy people and we salute you. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Terra Nullius. Happy birthday to you and many more. Aloha, let's go have some poke downstairs. There, the party continues. There, are, is there is a reception downstairs. You can stay up here and learn how to Charleston. There will be music, uh, many things. Films by Rick Kreilinger. Please stick around. It, the party continues. And one more thank you to our amazing MC, Wendy Hanamura, who made this day go so smoothly and so wonderfully. She worked so hard and tirelessly to bring this show to you. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. This has been an absolute pleasure. And let's party. Some of you are heading to Yerba Buena. We suggest.